the slides and the recording will be made available for download to all registered participants in the coming days. It will also be available on EPRI's YouTube channel. Um, please keep muted if possible, um, and unless you're prompted to speak by the chair or by one of the speakers. Please maximise your use of the, the chat for questions, um, and we encourage anybody to contribute to the chat. Whether you have a question or you just have a comment or maybe comment on experience or expertise, we're really welcoming that. So that's one of the main um, parts of today. And please address the, the chat to everyone so everyone can see it. We can save the chat and if there are some questions that are not covered, we can also circulate the, the chat with the answers. This is a, a research session and it's strictly for, for knowledge transfer. EPRI is governed by antitrust regulations and emphasise that presentations are not an endorsement of any product. Uh, service of view. The information is presented for, for information only and to further developments in the industry. We will circulate a list of contacts uh, for sharing during the session. So, on to the agenda. Um, I'm not going to go through the agenda um, in, in detail. You do have, I think, you should have copies of this, but there's basically several speakers from all corners of the, the industry uh, and academia. And there are two main sessions. We're splitting the two sessions by a break. The first one is on inertia um, providers and services, and the second is focusing on grid forming inverter providers and service services. So that's all um, really that, that I wanted to say by way of introduction. I'll be talking and, and, and hopefully directing some questions and summarising later on today. But now I'm going to pass on to Adrian, who's just going to talk to us about EPRI European Workshop Week. Thanks, Campbell. And I, just to say straight up, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, to chair the session. It's always great to have an independent um, specialist uh, uh, guiding the discussion and 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 prompting the questions. So pre appreciate that, uh, Professor Booth. Um, so this is just to say. So this is a, a joint workshop collaboration between ourselves and, and Nottingham University. But we we position it within the the wider EPRI Europe workshop week which is a used to be a, an in-person um, session in a, in a nice uh, city in Europe but uh, the last couple of years we've pivoted towards virtual and and here's the uh, there, there's four days this week it started yesterday um, with a session on climate resilience and a plenary uh, session today uh, the 22nd down here is is uh, we've this morning we had a great session about DER um, and we're talking inertia and there's another parallel session on on um, strategies for for innovation um, and then tomorrow we're going to talk about active planning for distribution systems and analytics for wind and solar uh, assets uh, and then finally on Thursday grid model management um, and carbon capture utilization so you can see very very broad range of topics it's free and should be open to register where you registered for this event you can register for it. You, we encourage you to go on there, register, contribute. If you know somebody that you, in your organization or even external that, that would that you think would be useful or would be interested, pass on the link. We're very uh, happy and open open for this. It's been a great couple of days so far and, and we just want to keep that going. Um, so that's that's pretty much it. We we we'll, we have a very tight agenda, uh, so we'll, we'll uh, keep the, the speakers and, and the attention moving. So I'll, I'll pass over to, to James, who's going to give, uh, um, James and Seamus, who are going to give the perspective from from Nottingham University. Thanks, Adrian. Um, hello, everyone. My name is James Rouse. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nottingham. Um, I first of all, just like to echo Adrian's comments there. Just thank Adrian's team and also Campbell for uh, chairing this session, and thank all of you for for participating. It's going to be a really good day. Um, we're in danger of running over already. So, Adrian, could you just go to the very last slide in that pack, please? Um, the comment I make it so. The reason Nottingham got involved in the concept of real inertia actually was through an EPSRC application that was successful a couple of years ago. And a spin out of that was a system called Shikis, which is effectively a hybrid flywheel based energy storage system. Um, I don't have time to go into it now. There's a paper on the screen which, you'll, which I encourage you to go look at if you're interested in, or contact myself or Professor Seamus Garvey at Nottingham. Um, but for the time being, I'll say it is a way of extending the range of the operational range of flywheel energy stores by introducing what is essentially slip energy. Um, thank you all for your participation in today's event and hope you'll enjoy it. I'll pass over back to Campbell now. Thank you very much for that. Um, so our first uh, speaker is Professor uh, Solomon Brown from Sheffield University. 
And he's really going to give us an overview and, and set the scene, which will then pave the way for the, the other speakers to take over. So over to you, Solon. Hi guys. Um, right, so I'm Professor Sol Brown from from the University of Sheffield, uh, where I'm a professor of uh, process and energy systems. I, uh, among other things, run our centre for doctoral training on energy storage, which is largely where I, I started working on inertia, um, and I lead our, our university's group on energy systems research. So I guess the the point for today was to give a gentle introduction to a discussion around inertia and look at some of the data specifically around UK that we've we've done some analysis of or, or rather a, a really good uh, a PhD student has has led for us. So uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll go start going through that. Great, right, so could you just maximize your screen a little bit more? It's just... Um shrunk in a little bit. Uh, Somebody's asked me to annotate. Let's take out my... Sorry, I'm not sure what's happening here. I think if you hit uh, escape, yeah. And then if you can maximize the screen, it should be somehow. Better? Yeah. Perfect, yeah. So, <laughs> right, so. Let's, let's move on. So uh, I guess the, the background to, to all of this conversation is really with the, with the deployment of more renewables there, the total amount of inertia on the system is, is going to reduce. And often renewable generators don't have any inertia or have low rotational inertia associated with, for example, some, some types of wind turbines. Uh, and because largely they're inverter connected, you, you lack the, the inertia, which is some of the frequency events that you, you really want to. So inertia is, is kind of an, in, an inherent uh, fact given from the conservation of momentum of rotating masses that helps provide some immediate response to power imbalances on the system. Um, and it helps generally maintain a stable frequency on the, on the network. So uh, well, when you're looking at kind of events, so where you have a, a sudden rapid um, power imbalance on our system, you have a frequency excursion a bit like this one. So your your frequency uh, your frequency will change with time as it always does. It will fluctuate with the small imbalances on the system. And if a large imbalance occurs, then you'll hit the, the boundary on which you want your frequency to exist. And once you've moved out of that region, in, in the case of this figure downwards, you'll have a frequency event which you will have to respond to as a system operator. So that will mean deployment of additional power to, to bring yourself back up within the frequency bounds and minimize the minimize the imbalance. Inertia is a is a property which acts as almost a viscosity. Uh, so a, a dampener on, on the movement of these uh, oscillations. So if you have inertia, enough inertia on your system, the excursion out of your frequency uh, domain will, will be slower and the amount of frequency response you need to deploy will commensurately be, be lower. So you have these two things which are tied together, the, the ability of a system to respond to frequency and the amount of frequency excursions and the amount of inertia on, on the network. And this is likely to kind of uh, dominate a discussion about uh, why inertia is, is useful because, because of the lowering amount of renewables on the network. Right. So we, we really need to understand the effects of this reduction in the inertia so that we can kind of, we can plan our system going forward, both the, the types of um, fast acting responsive generation that we have, that might be storage or that might be reactive um, or responsive dispatchable power in the form of kind of gas turbines or whatever we look for in the, in the future, and also resilience to largest loss events. So in, in the UK, that's currently about 1.34 gigawatts, and that would be a one, that's one power station, which is Drax in, in Yorkshire. Going forward, that's likely to change. So in, in the UK, we're, we're looking at the deployment of a large nuclear plant, Hinkley C, 
which will be of the order of 1.8 gigawatts. So the amount of the largest infeed loss that we're likely to look at and have to manage is, is likely to increase. Similar situations occur throughout the world, right? So this is just an example from the from the UK's network. Um, and if we dig into what's happening with the frequency deviations within the uh, currently and within the past few years, so you can see if we plot deviations up as a as a distribution, that it's a, it's a bit bimodal uh, around the 50 hertz point that we that we want to operate at. It's slightly slightly high. We get slightly more uh, uh, lower frequencies, so you, we we see uh, drops a little bit more than we see increases, and the ta tail of the distribution is a bit fatter at the at one at the higher end. So where where we have high events, so that's we'll we'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, what we want to do is is to map that over a, over a kind of uh, an amount of time and not only the number of events but the standard deviation so what is the volatility or the the size of each event and and how many major events occur uh, over the past five or six years you can see that the number of events is it's steadily it's steadily increasing uh, both high and low events um and we look for a kind of correlation between those with with what's happening on the on the grid itself uh, so here we we plotted the number of events against the rock odds, so the rate of change of demand. Um, we did, we look for a correlation against the the wind, the amount of wind and so renewables, wind and solar deployed on the grid, and there is a correlation, but it's not it's not sufficiently large for it to be causative. So it, the deployment of renewables in itself is not causing greater amounts of volatility and frequency. But you can also see from the two graphs at the top that. The, the number of events, both high and low, are, are very well aligned with the amount of, with, with the rate of change of demand. So there is there is a large part of uh, of react, kind of rapidly changing demand on the network affecting the amount of the number of events and the frequency volatility. Neither of these things fully explain what, what's happening on the network. What we know is that it's increasing, uh, and it's probably due to a large number of factors. So, because we're engineers, and I, I've been training, and I'm an applied mathematician, so we want to try to understand this by just using some simple models. And anyone uh, who's been doing power systems work has seen the swing equation, which is this this relatively simple little equation where we have the rate of change of frequency on the, on the left hand side here, and we that's that's affected by a number of things. The system inertia here, which acts as a kind of uh, as a dampener. Here we have frequency response, so where we want to deploy additional power um, uh, as part of our control strategy, kind of the net power imbalance um, here, so the difference between uh, generation and, and demand, and here demand damping, so additional control that we're able to provide through uh, rotational uh, demand, so where we're getting a kind of uh, demand side inertia. So if, if we use this simple, simple method to, uh, and we ally that with an understanding of the frequency response products that are existing. So the, this is a kind of a vague outline of the response, uh, frequency response products that were available uh, through National Grid uh, before they de deployed their, um, their new dynamic containment uh, product. So you can see it's a kind of high and low and very fast acting enhanced frequency response, and then different types of frequency response with their different characteristics. So we can use this as a, as a means of uh, pushing through the system's reaction based on the, the procured amount of um, a frequency response, push that through the swing equation, and we can see how a system reacts both in, in uh, largest in-feed loss and uh, kind of ongoing frequency control. Uh, our problem is if we want to if we want to project further into the future and understand how new uh, new mixes of of generation and demand will will be affected, and how how we might want to deploy either inertia or frequency to that, we need to understand what the frequency will look like um, on a, on a given day to day basis. And so we've come up with a a way of back calculating a a load imbalance and then from that feeding forward a, 
a um, frequency profile. So if if, the, if you want to have details on this, then we, I can provide you with a publication. But it's it's basically a way of of pulling pulling forward a frequency profile that we would then look at how a system would react to. Um, and once we have that data, then we can kind of take our list of scenarios and then we can feed it through the simple grid model that we have and we can understand how how uh, our system in, in the future would react under kind of the kind of the frequency profile that we've projected forward, both in the in the kind of short term largest infeed loss um, scenario. So if you if you suddenly lose your, your largest generator, how does that how is that affected by the amount of rock off? How, how is the rock off affected and how is the is the system able to respond sufficiently to to enable uh, recovery from an excursion? And similarly, if we just want to run run over over a longer period of time, whether we are able to control the amount of frequency, the smaller general frequency excursions which happen on a kind of day to day basis, and then we can trade off inertia against frequency response against those those metrics and understand to some extent what what, what amount of dispatchable power, dispatchable power being anything which is able to ramp quickly enough to provide services. And if we push this through uh, some of our models, then we can we can look at the number of excursions, which don't really change a great amount under scenarios where we're, we're, we're dropping the amount of inertia. And we can see similarly that the uh, uh, rock off is also is also changing rapidly. So for, on a on a normal on a normal operating scenario, if we if we project forward up to a scenario where we have have less dispatchable power, we're still able to maintain um, normal operation of the system. Uh, the, this data was just taken from a scenario where we had dropped the amount of dispatchable power and energy storage to about 30 giga, gigawatts capacity on the grid. So it's kind of a future scenario where we've decarbonized uh, to some extent. Uh, and because we kind of want to, uh, because people want to look at batteries for recovering this kind of thing and applying enhanced frequency response, so fast acting services, we had, we took a quick look at how a battery would be able to uh, recover ourselves from, from one of these excursions and what it would do to the battery. Um, so you, you need to look after batteries a little bit. And just, for, just from the analysis that we've seen in projecting forward some of the NGC, so national grids uh, scenarios, uh, we were able to look at the amount of, the number of cycles and the type of cycle that a battery would have to undergo to recover uh, most of the most of the performance of, of some lost inertia and you can see for, from the left hand side that actually you can kind of you get reasonable de deployments of batteries over the over the period from 2015 to 2025 20, and actually on the right hand side just providing frequency response the battery is being quite relaxed it's not having to deviate too much from its, its center point where it wants to sit so you're not actually going to be damaging the the, the battery sitting sitting there providing this very much by providing enhanced frequency response. Um, so if we ask ourselves what what mix of inertia and uh, frequency response do we need to mitigate the largest infeed loss in the UK? And then we can we can apply our analysis and have a look at uh, produce these plots where we have a kind of free on the top top graph here we have the frequency response capacity and then the, on the bottom on the x-axis we have the inertia and you can see that there's this kind of exponential type behavior and then we have a, a point at which we uh, at which we hit a level of inertia where where things sort of blow up and you can see that these are kind of uh, plotted against with the delay time of the of the frequency response so the slower the 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 slower the frequency response, the, the greater amount of inertia that you need on the system. So that's kind of intuitively correct. And the ramp times of the of the responsive uh, generation, so that representing maybe a battery or uh, against something like a, a gas turbine. Similarly, if, if they're slower, then the amount of um, 
the, the increase in the delay requires uh, a faster ramp time to get you up to speed. And so if, if your ramp time is, is not there, you need greater inertia to protect your system. So assuming these, assuming that we're at kind of the 1.32 gigawatts for, for a largest infeed loss, then kind of small increases in inertia reduce the total amount of frequency response required. So that's just the, the shape of the, the curve on, on the top left. The delay time is an important factor. So if you have very quick responding uh, services, so something more akin to synthetic inertia, then you can reduce the amount of inertia that you need on the system, but you can't completely do without it. And then there's a there's a kind of linear relationship between the ramp time of the frequency response and the amount of inertia on the system. So the the lower the ramp time, the more the more inertia you need. If we look at how uh, inertia reduction impacts the frequency volatility um, in general, so thinking back to the to the curves we saw before with the, the frequency over time, then we can see that with decreasing inertia from a point of uh, from 2018, we get an increased amount of of inertia uh, and an increasing standard deviation, so an increasing volatility of the frequency on the system. And if we and if we decrease the amount of demand side inertia, uh, then you can see that the, the low events grow quite rapidly. So this is uh, suggested by uh, this is driven by some of the uh, national grid scenarios. So you can see that actually we could we could end up with a greater amount of volatility on the system, and you would you would want more inertia there to protect that. So, but but we're seeing here importantly a great a growth in the low um, low events. So where we have uh, when we don't have sufficient where where our our frequency has, has dropped too far rather than too high. Uh, and then if we if we plot against that controlling the rock off, so the rate of change of frequency to minimum levels uh, as defined by the CRIG code, and map that against the amount of inertia on the system. So here we have kind of uh, our our current at the top. We have the blue curves, which are the are the current state of the the rock off limits set by the grid code, and the bottom are the are the limits that are, are set for the future. And here we have the the uh, the the current um, largest in feed loss and the and the projected forward largest in feed loss where we have Hinkley point C, and we can see the curve of the amount of uh, demand on the network and the amount of inertia provided. So anything above this curve here means that your rock off is, is not going to be violated in the case of the largest infeed loss. And so similarly, about, about two minutes left, if, if you can. Yeah, okay. Um, and if we're below here, then we violate. So you can see that we're, drop, we're going from a, a position just with the change in the definition of the rock off from uh, we, we're allowing ourselves to drop quite significantly in, in the amount of inertia that's required, but we're still above 50 gigavolts. Uh, and then uh, kind of lastly, really, if you can map against using the, the marginal cost of the frequency response, you can map the, the, the amount of um, the actual cost of providing frequency response against the amount of inertia that you, you, you would be replacing. And in some cases where you're looking at where you have no dispatchable, so by dispatchable kind of gas turbines, you're looking at an increased cost of maybe forty thousand pounds per per hour uh, for the duration of the system based on current dynamic containment uh, market data. So we can actually map, we can calculate the given cost of of, of replacing inertia by frequency response. And you can see the shape of the curve, so it's exponential where you have low inertia. And I guess just before I finish off, I, I just wanted to, to mention in passing the importance of, of inertia as a local thing. Um, so particularly in, uh, in the case of the UK, we ha we're having large synchronous generators shut down across the country. And why, whereas there was an amount of planning in place so that they would provide inertia where, where required, they're now coming off and we're not able to control that in the same way. 
So where inertia is, is going to become an increasingly important thing, whether that's real inertia or synthetic inertia. And I think that was a very key point going forward in system planning. Uh, just to finish myself off then, I would kind of my, my conclusions and, and give my thanks to my collaborators, uh, Re uh, Dr. Rachel Lee, Sam Flora Dermot and Niall from uh, Imperial College London. Uh, any questions, uh, please ask in the chat box. Yep, and we'll return to the questions at the, we've got a session specifically for questions um, and I'll keep a note of what's coming up in the chat there. So um, I'd just like to thank you very much, Saul. Um, I presume, that Adrian, that's the way you want to do it, is just have the questions at the end of this sort of session? Yeah, you can take them in the chat um, if you can stay on. If there's questions then coming up, then Saul can maybe answer them on the chat, and then we've got a 10-minute session just before the break. So I think in the interest of time, um, so that time it was excellent. We were actually a couple of minutes late starting with you. I'll now move on to Ben uh, Gomersill from, from National Grid, who's going to talk about system inertia, need and solution procurement. And again, I would appreciate if you could keep to time, please, Ben. Thanks very much. No worries. Um, hopefully you can hear me and see my screen there. Perfect. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you much, everybody. Um, so um, welcome to the session. So um, I'm Ben Gomersill from National Grid ESO. Um, so I work in the team that's kind of defining our um, system stability needs, which includes inertia. So we are looking at kind of um, out kind of 10, 15 years into the future, what is the inertia on the GB system going to be? Um, and then kind of what are kind of our needs in terms of deficit for managing that inertia? Um, and then we're starting to look at kind of what kind of solutions we need to put in place, either buying um, products through tenders or kind of um, changing codes so hopefully I can give you a bit of an understanding of the drivers behind that today, the size of that, and what kind of products we've got in place. Uh, right. Yeah, so a couple of things covered today. One, what are those trends in the system inertia, and then kind of how we're managing that in the ESO and for the GB system. Um, the first thing I wanted to touch on was kind of what's sitting behind kind of driving this big need, and it really is the decarbonisation of the system. So um, at National Grid ESO, we've got a kind of an ambition that by the year 2025, we want to be able to operate the system um, carbon free or net zero. And what that means in practice is that if the system is going to dispatch itself in a position where there is zero carbon on the system, we as the operator don't want, don't want to be taking operability actions that kind of do anything that resynchronizes carbon emitting plant. And what that really means for inertia is that if we want to be in a position where Either there's enough inertia on the system that we can operate it or the actions that we need to take in order to bring inertia back up to levels we want it at aren't going to be kind of resynchronizing anything that's emitting carbon. Um, in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I won't go through all of the slide, but you can see that graph there, kind of the kind of the progress we've been making towards um, a zero carbon system from the black line, which is 2013, going down through the colors to the 2021 in the blue there. Um, and then sitting behind kind of that um, decarbonisation, there's lots of engineering challenges that sit on the system. Um, some of them directly impacting the inertia, which we're talking about today, but other things as well um, in terms of um, other stability um, system strength issues, voltage or thermal. But if I keep the focus on the inertia for today. Um, so the real kind of drivers in terms of what we're seeing on the system are um, there being much less dispatchable generation. So whereas um, historically we'd be able to ring up a gas plant and ask them to increase or decrease their output or synchronize or desynchronize and that's much less able now in the, as we're moving towards a zero carbon world similarly we're getting much more variability in the sources of generation so much more wind much more solar which we get power out of when the when the wind blows the sun shines um, we're also getting much more asynchronous generation um, which is in turn kind of replacing the synchronous generation which i think as the previous speaker was saying um, that's where, we get, where historically we got most of our inertia from was through that synchronous generation and finally the generation is moving to different areas of the network again um, focusing on the the outskirts where there's wind by the coasts and in the highlands where there's much more wind um, and then the, the big driver out of those one is that move towards more asynchronous generation which is really driving down the inertia values on the system <clears throat> and i think i've got some some data here to kind of show that trend um, I'm afraid this is slightly out-of-date data. Um, we do our annual review of 
inertia kind of national grid kind of and the data is not quite ready for this year so this is last year's data i'm afraid um but it, the trends aren't changing it's showing us that um so four plots on the screen there i'm um, showing four different scenarios for the future those of you familiar with fez will recognize the names um what but they're all showing the same trend in data which is that um inertia is getting lower um so the 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 orange is the current year, the blue is 2026, and the green is 2031. So you can see across them, the, the data is moving down, which is showing the decrease in inertia. And it's also staying lower for longer, which is kind of the, the shift to the right as well in the graphs. So that's the kind of real challenge that we're seeing at National Grid is on the GB system as a whole, that inertia is lower and it's operating lower for longer. Um, and we've got, I was going to talk through, but I think the previous speaker spoke on around what those thresholds are for inertia. So um, currently we have a minimum inertia on the system of about 140 GVA seconds, um, which is driven by our loss of mains, um, 0.125 hertz per second. Um, but that's kind of being replaced now, such that those loss of mains relays are almost all gone. Um, and the new kind of lowest inertia that we're expecting to see is somewhere around the 100 GVA seconds limit. Um, that's driven by a wanting to keep um, rate change of frequency about 0.5 hertz per second. Um, sorry, I'm getting a, a ping in my ears. Hopefully, you can still see my screen. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so um, inertia minimum of about 100 GVA seconds driven by trying to keep the rate change of frequency down to about half hertz per second for a largest loss of about 1800 megawatts. Um, and if you use the swing equation that the previous speaker spoke about, you get a limit of around 90 GVA seconds that um, would contain that. Um, however, when you do see that large loss in the system, it's also associated with an inertia loss, which is something you need to consider. So when you're losing the megawatts, you're also losing some inertia that's associated with it. So we obviously need to keep it a little bit higher such that post the loss of that unit, um, we're both that we're still above that 90 GVA seconds limit. Um, in terms of what's driving that half a hertz per second value, um, it's kind of the interaction, as, as we've said before, about the inertia and then dynamic containment and then primary frequency response. So what we're really interested in is keeping frequency stable um, through the injection of active power and our inertia is injecting that very fast either instantaneously or within kind of the order of five milliseconds if it's grid forming. Um, we then have something slightly slower through our dynamic containment products and then something slower again through the traditional primary frequency response. Um, so there's work ongoing kind of trying to get what the exact balance is between those. But it feels like if we can use inertia to keep rate change of frequency down to about half hertz per second, that seems to be the right, the right balance. And you get very complicated interactions where you get kind of four and five dimensional graphs of various different components all interacting with each other. Um, and the final thing I wanted to say on this was that whilst we're talking about inertia today, the driver that's causing the decline of inertia in the system, which is the decline of signal generation, is also causing a decline in short circuit level, uh, dynamic voltage and system strength. So when we are looking at solutions, and I would encourage other kind of network operators around the world to really be looking at these holistically so that you're kind of looking for solutions that address all three together rather than trying to address the inertia and then look at those. Um, cool. I was now going to run through a, a few projects we've got ongoing at National Grid um, and how we're managing inertia. Um, the first is our stability pathfinder projects. Um, I'm sure many of you will have heard of these. Um, we've kind of got three phases ongoing. Um, the first one was kind of purely looking at buying inertia. So we ran that, um, gosh, I think it was a couple of years ago now, um, but with solutions that we expect to deliver between April 20 and April 2021. Um, so that was, we because we wanted to run a quick tender, we limited it to synchronous technologies only operating at zero megawatts. Um, but the tender was awarded in January 2020 and we kind of um, procured contracts for 12.5 GVA seconds of inertia for the cost of 328 million um, and I think that was kind of we were pitching it as the first in the world kind of service of buying inertia through a market um, we've kind of followed that up with a second one where we're looking both at the inertia and the regional short circuit level 
um, and that was kind of focused in Scotland only. So we identified a, a specific need in the Scotland area, and that one we were looking to buy an additional six GB seconds of inertia plus some short circuit level. Um, and critically for this tender, we decided to open it up to grid forming technologies as well as synchronous solutions. Um, so we have there's statistics online if you want to look them up, um, just type in Stability Pathfinder. Um, but we got a lot of um, options from developers with grid forming technologies. So there's I think some sessions later today about the technology, so I'm going to it. Um, but we're expecting to announce the bids um, very soon, like within the order of next weeks or months. So unfortunately, I, I know the likely outcomes, but I, I can't share that with you at this stage. Um, but w we do know that um, as part of the feasibility study, there were some grid forming technologies that did pass that stage. So we are kind of able to, or the providers were able to demonstrate that the grid forming technologies can meet the specification that we wrote for providing inertia. Um, and the final thing just to, to conclude is that we also have a, a third one that's ongoing, um, procuring another 15 GB seconds of inertia um, for the England and Wales. Um, again, open to grid forming and synchronous. Um, what that means is a total is once these three projects conclude, um, we will have bought uh, of the order of 35 GB seconds of inertia through them, which is about a third of our total system need of inertia will be provided for by um, commercial services provided to the system operator. Um, the other thing I wanted to touch on, I think there's a couple more things. Um, the first was um, the recent grid code update. So in terms of um, getting inertia and other stability services from grid forming, we've updated the grid code in the last few years. So we've got codified in there what we want to look, what we define as grid forming. That's both for synchronous and converter-based technologies. Um, so in there, if we ever want to buy or define a service as providing inertia or short circuit level, um, we have a specification in there that we can point to and anybody can meet. Um, so I think that was um, concluded recently and was signed off by the regulator. So if you look, um, open up the latest version of grid code, um, you'll be able to see that definition in there. Um, the final thing I wanted to talk through today um, was then um, what the future looks like for, we've talked about what the pathfinders are going, what are ongoing at the moment. Um, we've had a lot of work and kind of what does the future look like for stability and inertia procurement in the UK? Um, are we doing this the best way? Should there be a market rather than a long-term procurement? Um, and to that end, we've recently um, launched and we're about to conclude an innovation project where we've been working with uh, consultants who are experts on market design and market design um, to come up with kind of how they would recommend to us um, we should set up and establish the markets in future um, what's the best way to buy that the most economic way that we're going to get value for consumers and still be able to maintain a secure system for buying inertia so um, I think the innovation project report is either available now or will be very shortly if it's not and then we're currently working internally on a response to that to kind of how we intend to kind of deal with those kind of outputs to shape the future of buying inertia in the UK or the GB system, I should say. Um, that's kind of all I had to talk through today. Hopefully I've stayed on time and I'm not too much over and I've got a questions, but it sounds like we might be doing questions all together a little bit later. No, that, that was great. And thanks very much. You've actually saved us a couple of minutes. Of time. Um, yeah. I think if you can maybe go, Ben, I mean, the chat's getting a bit busy, but if you can look, there was, I think you answered the previous question in your um, presentation, perhaps just for, for keeping us to time and we can maybe sum up at the end, if you could maybe look at the chat and perhaps answer any that you see that you've maybe got something to contribute to, but there's already some nice debate and questions going on about the commercial side of things and interesting to see that grid forming inverters have made it as part of a uh, inertia server provision. So if you can have a wee look at that now that you've finished speaking and perhaps Add to yeah. that and we'll try and summarise it at the end. So we're pretty much back on track now, time-wise. I think we're on about one minute late according to the um, to the, the schedule. So now um, we have uh, Ruri Costello from ESB, who's going to talk about, um, I think it's just coming up here, Money Point Synchronous Condenser and Flywheel Project in Ireland. So again, if you can stick to the 15 minutes, that would be greatly appreciated. Over to you. Thanks.
I'm not sure if he's on mute. Can't read anything. Rory, we can see your screen and it was on full screen there, but um, we can't hear anything yet, or certainly I can't. I think, yeah, you should probably be able to hear me now. <laughs> I hope. Just uh, to share again. Just try sharing again, yeah. Is that sharing? It's sharing okay, yeah. It's just on the sort of viewer mode as opposed to slideshow mode, though. Slideshow, okay. It says thanks. No. <clears throat> okay. Hi, Rory Costwell here. Um, just presenting today on the Money Point Synchronous Condenser, also known as a compensator. Um, and there's a flywheel also added on this. This is phase one of the Green Atlantic project in Ireland. Um, I'm based over in Dublin on the east coast there, and Money Point is on the west coast with the Atlantic Ocean to the side, hence the, the Green Atlantic project. So at the moment, uh, in Money Point, we have three coal units, about 900 megawatts each. And you can see the picture on the left. There's five small wind turbines as well. And Money Point started producing electricity back in 1985. And at its peak, it would have met about 25% of the electricity demand in the island of Ireland. Yeah, I suppose ESB has a target of net zero by 2040. And the Green Atlantic project would be a, a key project in that uh, ambition. The first phase of it is the synchronous condenser, which I'm going to talk about. The second phase is an offshore wind farm. And the third phase will be hydrogen uh, production and storage on site. Uh, there will also be an offshore wind construction and an O&M an &M depot on site. Just briefly to describe what a synchronous condenser plant is. It's a large motor plugged into the grid. We've added the flywheel to increase the mass of that, uh, which increases the inertia on the system. It takes a small amount of power from the grid, about one and a half percent of rating. And it's, uh, its job is to support, the, it's 400 kV voltage at money point. Uh, it'll rescue the system in, uh, in the event of a frequency drop. And you can see kind of the frequency, typical frequency curve in Ireland for a much smaller system than the UK. Uh, it's, it's quite severe and rock off, so greater than one hertz per second. Synchronized at 50 hertz and 3000 RPM, and it's, it's clean. There's no fuel, there's no combustion. Um, okay. So this is the location at Money Point. Um, you can see on the right hand there side there, the site in red, and there's the three transformers for the three units. We've actually had to tie into the existing grid connection. Initially, we had planned on a kind of a, a separate uh, site over here on the left for uh, Money Point with a dedicated grid connection, but there were issues with that. So we had to adapt over the last couple of years and go with the tie in, which is quite new. And um, access will be via the main um, entrance to Money Point station. So there's been a lot done since 2019. I started looking at this. Um, we got the planning permission in place. Then we had to get a contract in April of last year that was awarded to Siemens. We had to carry out ground investigations on the site. We had to get uh, a grid connection initially for that uh, other site. And then we had to switch and apply again to get the, or not. We were maintaining the grid connection, but you still had to um, add the unit to the system. So we had to modify our existing grid connection. And then we had to consider any environmental um, implications on that site. Money Point is an important site from an environmental point of view. So you have to be careful what you put there in terms of fuel and the impact on the environment and also noise as well. So equipment has been decided on and at the moment we're in the construction phase and that should come to an end over the summer and with testing and handover um, late summer. High level program uh, design review kind of started last year in 21. Uh, Siemens started on site in September. Factory acceptance testing has just been completed recently. 
um, in April. Um, and look, the main equipment, the, the, the motor and the flywheel will arrive from May, but we do have some small transformers coming next week. And they're on site, they're doing installation works at the moment. Uh, so between March and hopefully July, that has to be completed so as to re-energize the transformer, that shared transformer um, commissioning in July and um, testing in August with final takeover in September. But it's important to note, we also need an outage on unit two, uh, approximately three months. We managed to reduce that with the uh, input from Siemens. So that, that's good. And um, so that will happen as well. And the transformer will be switched out. So look, this is the best picture we have to date uh, from Siemens of what it will look like. You see the generator motor on the right and flywheel on, on the left. So it's a Siemens SGEN 5 1200A two-pole machine. It's air-cooled. It's a well-proven generator in thermal applications, and its many references as synchronous condensers also. It's got a reactive power range of plus 260 megabars into the system, and it can absorb 140 megabars from the system. It can also contribute 947 uh, MVA of short circuit. And the inertia of the synchronous condenser is 512 megawatts seconds of energy. So we added the flywheel, as I said, to increase the mass. Um, and that brings up the total inertia of the unit to 4,000 megawatts seconds. And that would be equivalent to one of our large, uh, now when I say large in Ireland is 400 megawatts, combined cycle units in Ireland would have a similar uh, inertia. The plan is to operate it remotely from Dublin. It'll start up within 15 minutes and there will be a, an LTSA contract in place uh, regarding the maintenance. This is a slide on the flywheel. Um, it, it's just in terms of inertia, it's good to kind of talk about that and summarize. It, it is a kind of new technology. There were no references in, in, in place at the time when we put the contract in, but there, there were orders gone out. And since then, Siemens have, have commissioned flywheels and some have been operating in Australia and Wales. The design is based on existing generator rotors and LP turbines. The forging was carried out in Italy. That's the top picture there. You can actually see a sample taken from the end of the, the flywheel there. And that would have been machined out when it was delivered to Mulheim. Um, it's four meters long and it's 2.2 meters in diameter and it's uh, just one block of metal. It's water cooled and it's under vacuum to reduce friction losses. So recently our engineers were, were over in Mulheim to witness a balancing and overspeed test which was completed successfully. They ran the unit up to 3600 rpm and held it there for a number of minutes. Um, since it was new technology, one of the important things we decided on ESB was it was an optional price to get a full rotating validation test before we received the unit of money point. So what will happen there is that Siemens will uh, use a motor, run up the machine in the test pit, uh, run it for a number of hours, stable operation, and then they'll open the breaker and the unit should uh, coast down over a number of hours uh, without power, so on friction alone. Um, and that's due uh, the end of this month. Uh, the pictures there, they're very recent. We got them yesterday, and that's kind of what the final unit looks like at the moment. So the site layout, if we start down in the the bottom right, you've got cooling fans and you've got the main uh, machine house, which has the, the synchronous condenser and the flywheel. Then you've got the IPV uh, with the circuit breaker to the left of that. And then it takes a right hand turn up into the existing uh, unit two pole unit in, uh, in Money Point. We've also got some power control centers which contain batteries, control equipment, etc. Um, and we've an emergency diesel generator on site as backup. But it, it was important to us that we size the batteries fully 
um, to safely run down the, the unit uh, on loss of power from the grid. So look, some of the challenges today, and I mentioned the new technology and our internal due diligence on that, I mentioned the change in the site, the integration itself was quite novel to unit two in terms of protection and control. Um, and uh, as a result of that, we had to find documentation belonging to unit two, which was for over 40 years old, and that was challenging to get the correct documentation. The IPB scope itself, we had initially decided to to change unit two's IPB because we couldn't find short circuit information as built information on IPB. So we we had to do a study eventually, and we've reduced that scope, which has helped reduce the outage on unit two. Uh, fire protection and insurance is not to be underestimated with these projects. Um, they're quite new from an insurance point of view. I mean, we have a detection only system on site, but we also have a water um, available for the fire service. Um, and getting the flywheel from Italy up to Mulheim in Germany, where it is at the moment, uh, there was issues with that and the weight uh, on the temporary track. So it had to be moved by canal first. Um, and then on the grid side, there's a few challenges there because new technology again, there was a potential risk of subsynchronous resonance a capacitor on the, the transmission system networks um, causing an impact and possible vibrations um, on the unit, which we ruled that out in conjunction with, with AirGrid, the TSO. Metering is new for synchronous condensers and you get errors at large megawars. So we've had to implement kind of backup meter into to kind of check the AirGrid metering. Uh, the grid code, that's written for thermal generators. So, um, and the commercial operation piece and how this unit will uh, run in the market. Um, so Airgood are bringing out a new document for synchronous condensers specifically, which will cover a lot of these um, uh, issues. In conclusion there, that's the site at the moment. You can see the IPVs of the existing, uh, no, it's this one, the existing unit. And uh, they're they're building up the machine house at the moment and concrete pour. So there's a little video here that uh, Siemens Energy produced for February. We get that on a monthly basis. So I'll play this now. Now I may have to just move this to my other screen. And can you see that video? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. So I'll just press play. Okay, um, look, that's the end of my presentation. It was a high level summary. A lot, of, a lot of good people involved here on the ESB side and the Siemens side. So um, if anyone would like further information, feel free to contact me. Thank that's you. Great. That's great, Rory. Thanks very much. And when you get a look at the chat, you'll see there's probably half a dozen or so questions uh, <laughs> that have been directed for you. So if you can maybe... Okay. Respond in the chat and then also we'll maybe come back to try and take a wee collective. Um, there's quite a few technical questions about that, so it was really interesting and that's exactly what, what today's session is all about. So, again, and thanks again for, for sticking to time. So, we can now move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is um, Vijay Shinde from Siemens Energy. 
who's going to talk us about about the hardware aspects of the, the synchronous condensers and flag rules. Maybe actually we'll address some of the, the stuff that was posed to Rory because there was a couple of questions about the design of that. Over to I you then. Are you on there, VJ? I can't find your name on the... Maybe he's not here. Might have signed in or something else. VJ? Hello? Okay, oh. we, oh, I was looking for him there. He mustn't have uh, made it or maybe got confused at the time. Maybe we can move to, um, to Brian Berry. Uh, I think he's the oh, last. last that's fine. There. It means we've got a wee bit more time and we might have a bit more time for Q&A. And the coffee break's only 10 minutes, so we'll maybe steal an extra five minutes for that. So, um, Brian, I don't know if you're, if you're there. Again, he's hopefully signed in in advance. Yeah, I'm, um, yeah. Good man. So we've got Brian Berry now from Reactive Technologies. Um, and this is about inertia measurement solutions, which I think is very interesting a topic with some real world examples. So over to you, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm right. I can get my presentation shared, I hope. Yep, can see it. Wonderful. Okay, so um, yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, reactive technologies inertia solution. Uh, it's quite an innovative solution and, and something that we spoke about at uh, at the previous um, previous session, I can't remember if it was a year ago or two years ago now, but um, but yeah. Um, so since then, we've had some uh, some real world uh, examples of, of data coming in, and it's really exciting. Wanted to share some of the the data with you. So uh, just a bit of the background first um, of, of of why. Is measuring inertia so important? And I think we've touched on this in, in a lot of places. As you can see, there's huge investment um, uh, ideas uh, and, and solutions going into this. And as the, as um, as we move from the left hand side of this graph here, yeah, where we have our traditional fossil fuels, um, and we and we start to to switch those off, we need to replace that with either synthetic inertia synchronous inertia that's clean, for example, synchronous condensers or, or hydro. Um, so that's going to be increasing. And quite often that can be distributed in nature. It might not be as uh, traditionally observed as, as the older, bigger fossil fuel uh, solutions. So as uh, inertia decreases, uh, so does our cost and our risk. Uh, and, and in a lot of ways, uh, so it's something that we, we we took for granted. We didn't actually pay much money for inertia back in the day. But what's interesting about it as well is when we look at the estimates of inertia, so when we estimate inertia from SCADA systems or from our, from our known generator, um, there's a large portion of known inertia. But as we move into the future, that goes into a distributed model. Instead of getting inertia from a handful or, or hundreds of, of devices, you could be getting it from thousands or tens of thousands of synthetic uh, devices. So the error and the risk in our uh, estimation of inertia could go up. And that necessitates a need for trying to solve this problem and trying to, to um, get a better handle of inertia. One of the ways we do that is, is we've got a novel way of measuring inertia, which I'll talk about. So um, I don't want to go into this too much. Lots of talks today around how can you solve the problem of low inertia? Well, foster frequency reserve, synchronous condensers or uh, clean synchronous generation, synthetic inertia. These are all solutions, each with their pros and their cons, right? So I'm not here to advocate any one, one of those. All that I, I, I am uh, or do want to highlight is that no matter how you cut it, these things are expensive and it's costs that we never had to actually cater for in the traditional power system before. So optimizing, um, when, we, when we optimize our purchases, it's very important that our models are highly, highly accurate. So that our, our investment decisions are, um, are very much uh, accurate and, and most cost effective at the end of the day to the consumer, right? So that our electricity prices don't continue to go up for no reason. So let's talk about the technical stuff. Okay, so that's more of the why. 
but let's just, we're all engineers, let's just get into the, into the technical. So what is it that we, we do? The way we measure inertia is very similar to um, the concept of sonar. If you kind of think of sonar sending out a, a, a pulse into the, into the sea, and it measures the reflections, and that tells you how far away the seabed is, for example. Um, we are pert, uh, creating perturbations in the power system. We are actually creating megawatt injections, very purposefully, uh, into, the, into the power system. And the key thing here is that we do it with a periodic signal. So if you look at this picture here, which is just a, a hyperbole and exaggerated version, but essentially we're creating a repeated micro frequency perturbation that we're able to measure from frequency measurements all around the grid. We've got the power measured at the uh, location of injection. So what we call a modulator. So we have a modulator creating this periodic uh, injection and we measure that very accurately. And we've got frequency measurements all around the grid. And uh, we extract that from the noise and that allows us to then calculate inertia essentially with a swing equation. So a very quick kind of way of saying it is it's like applying the swing equation in the frequency domain, okay, with a periodic excitation. Um, so that's what we do. And um, just to give you an example here, so as I say, my main focus is to talk about some real data here, right? So um, we, uh, in this presentation, I'm going to be covering two examples we've done. One is in um, in uh, an island uh, off the coast of Scotland, which was um, in a microgrid operation, total generation of around 20 megawatts. And the other one is the entire Great Britain grid, right, which is anything from 20 gigawatts through to 60 gigawatts worth of um, capacity. So. I just want to show you here, this is real data. I'm showing um, two periods, two Friday afternoons. On the left, we have um, a bunch of signals from Great Britain where we have no modulation. And on the right, we have a, a similar time a week later where we are actually modulating. And uh, one thing you'll note, so you should see, if you could see the modulation, you'd see about six cycles or so in this period. And you can't see it. And in fact, it looks very similar to where there is no modulation. And that is exactly the point. These deviations are tiny. You cannot see them with the human eye. Okay. So it's, it's a, a non-disruptive perturbation that we're creating. So talking about our solution a little bit um, more, I just want to give you an idea of how this actually works. So because we are creating a power disturbance, you can actually schedule inertia measurement. You don't have to wait for an event or, 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 or build up some sort of artificial intelligence. You literally can say, okay, tomorrow I want to run from midnight through to one o'clock. I want to get a continuous stream of inertia. And that's our system. That's how it, it um, basically works. And at the end of the day, what that schedule produces is then a trend of inertia. Okay, so just give you an idea of that solution. So let's jump into um, some results. So first of all, I'll talk about the um, architecture that was used in the microgrid. So remember, the total uh, demand of that grid is around 20 megawatts, largely fed off pretty ancient diesel generators, okay, north of Scotland. Um, so yeah, not the, not the fanciest equipment in the world. But they wanted to test the inertia in that system. They wanted to understand if they were running it adequately and expose any risks around their operation strategy. So what we did is we, we the typical solution, we have a modulator. In this case, we used a 50 kilowatt load bank, which we ran at uh, 15 kilowatts. So you can rent these. This is just the standard load bank that we rented, and we tied it into a solid state switch that we controlled. We had PMUs and uh, uh, frequency measurements all around the grid, five, uh, five in this particular grid. And uh, that goes into our cloud platform where the calculation is and produces inertia. So the end result is um, over around 20 days worth of running. We've got a full trend of inertia here. You can see it. Um, so you can see different um, sort of a demand curve, I suppose, per day. 
Um, and you can also see, if you look very carefully, it's not the greatest picture in the world, but you can see a confidence interval around each of those inertia periods. So it's actually showing you the um, uh, the variance or the accuracy uh, confidence we have in that measurement. Now, what's interesting about this is, okay, you look at the demand curve, you say, okay, this is the I've seen this before. You're going to have uh, a certain pattern on the weekday, and you're going to have a certain pattern on the weekend, and you're going to have a certain pattern in summer, and a certain pattern in winter, and it's all going to make a lot of sense. But when we looked at this data, we actually were able to class three different classes or three different profiles. The first one kind of has inertia stepping up in the morning, stays up the whole day, drops off in the evening. Okay, that's pretty common. That's what I would expect a weekday to look like. The next one's a bit weird. It steps up in the morning and then slowly drops over the entire course of the day. And then the last one is inertia is kind of low the whole day. Now, if I didn't say put right any of these names here, and if you're anything like me, you look at this and you say, oh, this low one is definitely the weekend. This high one's definitely middle of the week. And you know what? This is probably Friday when everyone goes home early. Okay. Well, no. Because if you look at it, you've got Sunday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday. This one's got a Saturday. This one's got a, a Wednesday and Monday. This one's got a Tuesday, Sunday. It's not like that. There's no pattern to this. And that's because it's dependent very much on the generation and the industry that is running at that particular time. Now, when we talk about inertia and training models from um, demand uh, curves and capacity curves, and uh, tuning it with events that happen, let's say, three to five times a month, it's not enough to actually capture these intricacies. So that's just uh, one very interesting output that we found here of, of the different profiles in, in the grid. The next thing is, um, it's all good and well to measure inertia, but really what's important is giving advice to the grid and saying, how do we make the how do, how do we give you advice on how to better run your grid? So what we did is we looked at all the events that occurred over those times. Three of these events actually led to load shedding. So what we did is we kind of had a look at this. So if you look at all of these events plotted on a frequency curve, you can see that um, some of the ones that actually caused load shedding, these red ones, um, these are the ones down here. These are the three the three bad events. And when you plot them on rock hold, you can see that if you basically have a rock hold over 0 0.6 hertz, that's going to lead to under frequency load shedding in this case. Okay, we did something a bit more fancier than just looking at these charts, but that's essentially what we came down to as we worked out that this, um, the secure rock hold in this particular grid is 0 0.6 hertz. Now, bear in mind that is based on this grid's frequency response and availability and speed. Okay, it might not be the same in your grid. So, turning this on its head, we say if we want to secure a rock off of 0 0.6 hertz per second, what is the maximum amount of power we can lose for a known inertia? And you land up with this curve. So, this is the amount of power we can lose over those 20 days. And what that actually leads to is this chart here. It says, if your largest loss is 0 0.5 megawatts, you're secure 100% of the time. Conversely, if you increase that and your largest loss becomes 1.5 megawatts, you're, you're actually insecure almost 90% of the time. And when you get a largest loss of two megawatts, you're insecure 100% of the time. What does this mean? So fundamentally the grid these guys who were running the grid, they were saying, our policy is find out what your largest loss is, which is typically their generator. It's a three megawatt diesel generator. They said, as long as our frequency reserve is equal to three megawatts, they're equal to our largest loss, we're golden. The answer to this is no, you're not golden. Because even though you have that reserve, it's not fast enough to prevent the under frequency load shedding. And in fact, yeah. sorry for interrupting, but we do have VJ back now, so um, I'll need to keep you to time. So there's only really two minutes left for your allocated no 15, if no that's problem. okay. Thanks, mate. So, um, 
so yeah, so that's that's uh, the lesson that was learned is that they are um, they are running insecure a large percentage of the time, and they updated their models and improved their frequency response. Now, talking about national grid, um, very similar except a lot bigger. Okay, now, as I say, twenty to sixty gigawatts demand. So here, the modulator is a five megawatt ultra capacitor. Why? Because ultra capacitors can cycle without degrading as much as uh, batteries. We've got frequency measurements all around the grid, 40 measurements, and again, coming into that platform. This is initial, uh, these are initial results, so you'll see that it's, you can't actually see the date and time or whatever, but just to give you an idea, this is uh, comparing to estimates and forecasts, and here we're seeing the inertia trending against that. So in general, it matches the forecast quite well, but there are periods where it is quite a lot lower. Looking at the same thing on this slide, here, unfortunately different colors, um, but uh, when we zoom into the low area, you can definitely see where the measurements is tracking quite a lot lower than the estimated value, which is exactly what, it, it, you know, it's uncomfortable to know, but it's exactly what the project was there to find out, is tr to try expose risk. We'll have some more information of this coming out later in the year, um, but this is the initial taster of uh, what it looks like. <coughs> so with that, I will, uh, I'll stop there and, and, and we'll go to your questions later. Great stuff, Brian. Thanks very much um, for that. So it was really, really interesting um, to see the sort of the measurement side, because it's very important to know what you're dealing with, isn't it? So, um, Good stuff. So we do have um, VJ Shindy from Siemens, I believe, online, and he's going to talk us about to us about the the hardware um, aspects of synchronous uh, condensers or compensators and flywheels. So VJ, if you're there, if you can get started and share your screen, be great. And if I can ask you to stick to fifteen minutes, please, that would be fantastic. Uh, thanks, Campbell. Can you share my, see my screen? I'm sharing the slide. Not yet. I don't think. Yep, it's coming. I think. Great. And if I yeah, full screen. Are you able to see? It's not on slideshow yet for me. I don't know if you've maybe got two screens, if you're maybe sharing one of the actual screens as opposed to the application. You maybe have to try and share this slideshow. Yeah, it's just coming up on the screen. Is it any good? Ah, now it's on speaker mode. <laughs> uh, okay. It's yep. Okay. I'll try again. Can you see my screen now? We can see your screen, but it's still in the viewer mode, like the editing mode, not the slideshow mode. Yeah, slideshow. Um, still, you can see the slides, though, right? You can see the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, whenever I put it in the slideshow, yeah. I think we just carry on with this. Yeah, I think it's, it's probably okay. First of all, apologies, uh, technical glitch. So I joined a bit late. Uh, and I'm going, to, I understand that the time is limited about 15 minutes. So I'm going to be quick. I got about seven slides to show. I guess people have already talked much about inertia. Uh, uh, and though inertia is, is, is a state of not to change, I think we will uh, we'll talk about inertia in this and the hardware. Uh, in terms of uh, grid services, what this inertia means. So there are, when we talk about inertia, and this is not the static device, when we're talking about the rotating device and how the rotating mass is off, offers that inertia, the two main component comes to mind is synchronous condenser and flywheel. So we will discuss those two, uh, we'll touch upon them. So synchronous condenser is nothing but a synchronous machine. Uh, without prime mover, it can act as a synchronous motor or with prime mover, it has act a synchronous generator. So when we say synchronous condenser, it is nothing but a <coughs> synchronous machine without any kind of turbine. Uh, this synchronous machine, however, is designed to optimize solution, to offer the solution for short circuit level and uh, or reactive power. So uh, that's how it, it is. It differs from the normal synchronous machine. Uh, and this synchronous machine is rotating at 3000 RPM if it is four pole machine or two pole machine, depending on that. Uh, 
and it is since it's operating at, at a synchronous speed, it offers a, a very good amount of synchronous uh, inertia to the system. In terms of uh, megawatt seconds, we're talking about somewhere between <coughs> three megawatt seconds to 625 megawatt seconds for a normal design of these machines, which is a quite a, quite a large number. And you see, the, uh, there's a schematic on my screen which shows how the synchronous machine is connected to the grid and what is how it differs from the normal synchronous machine operation. So through the HV transformer, which is uh, which is a step up or step down transformer, it is a low impedance transformer. So normal uh, uh, transformers you see in 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 on the grid somewhere between five percent to 12% uh, impedance range. Uh, this is a very uh, low impedance transformer, less, I will say less than 5%. Uh, what it offers is, is, is high current and high short circuit level to the, to the grid. This is going through the point of wave circuit breaker and rest of the auxiliary systems. So that in total offer the solution to the grid for grid stability for short circuit level and reactive power control as well as inertia. If we are looking at the system which need higher inertia, then we would want to include a flywheel to the same shaft of the generator. So this is the generator, which is, uh, uh, when I say generator, it means synchronous condenser. When we extend the shaft with the clutch, and this is a flywheel, which is a uh, which which can take offer inertia up to 4,000 megawatt second. That's a quite large inertia. Uh, it, this will give the in uh, in Great Britain recently been procured inertia of somewhere about 7.5 gigawatt uh, uh, seconds, and we're talking about 4,000 gigawatt seconds here. So that's a kind of large <clears throat> inertia we we discussing here. Can also read on the slide here the the machine or the flywheel is is reduce friction losses and i will touch upon that how we reduces that friction losses using the vacuum operation and with the shaft seal concept so we got a double layer casing here uh, which which basically just offer a, co a cover which is not mechanically i won't say it it mechanically protected but uh, it gives a, a, just a cover then we have vacuum piping, uh, and the, the way the reason because this very large rotating mass offers a large frictional losses, and that's why it need uh, to be in the vacuum, and that's why we have vacuum system there, instrumentation, bed plate, and rotor bearing, and rest of the things required for flywheel. Uh, we have seen in the market there are vertical flywheels, but given the synchronous condenser, such a large machine, we're talking about somewhere 200, 350 tons machines, uh, and it is a horizontal uh, shaft. So we, the, the the largest flywheel in the industry are always always horizontal flywheels. On the next slide, uh, you see the how the cooling of uh, also done with the water flow connection so the, the there is a water running in a in a mandric water channels uh, fashion and cooling water is out of stainless steel all parts uh, uh, which are in touch are, are made up of stainless steel there is no water leakage possibility uh, and the interesting fact is that uh, over the lifetime of flywheel there is no maintenance is required Again, the flywheel operation here, uh, this picture shows how it is operating under vacuum. It reduces the sound pressure level. It also reduces the friction losses and the less OPEX there. Also, there, there are vacuum seal in, in the picture here with the carbon brush technology. And we also need to understand that over pressure only for breaking the flywheel and together with the static frequency controller for shutdown. Uh, and I mean, there are plenty other uh, things to be considered, but the key consideration, this is a <sighs> rotating mass in terms of, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of tonnage, and you would want to use a flywheel with the, with the given experience of, um, and if you see the size of the flywheel is about 800 mega compares to 800 megawatt steam turbine train. I mean, we're talking about the kinetic energy 
stored in that flywheel, which uh, we just did a hand calculation on the back page of the envelope uh, somewhere, and it could fly the flywheel up to five kilometers away if it decide to fly, uh, exert its kinetic energy. So we're talking about a serious uh, uh, rotating mass out there. So the design experience and the safety is, is of major concern uh, or the major aspect need to be considered. I think uh, I have made my presentation quite succinct and small. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, VJ, and that, that was great because it got us um, back on time um, perfectly. So now um, there's been a lot of activity uh, on the chat interspersed with various other um, messages, so I don't know if uh, if anyone has, has anything in particular to say, and I know that some of the other guys involved in organising this might be organising the questions into a list, um, but we do have quite a lot of questions on the chat, and I think most of them, if not all, have been addressed um, yeah. by answers. So I, what I maybe would say at this stage yeah. is if any of our speakers want to elaborate on an answer or if they've picked something up, I'll maybe ask the speakers if there's anything particularly maybe want to say in the open forum. Vijay, I see that you had your hand raised there. Just a quick one. I just saw one question here. Someone asked me, uh, MVR and megawatts and shares in cost and stuff like that. I'm happy for you to uh, share my contact details uh, of Siemens Energy and they can contact me and ask about, I don't think this is the right forum to uh, discuss cost or uh, and all the details of the machine types. I think that's, that's, that's a great, great response to that because I also made a, a, a comment at the start that, you know, we don't really go into commercial matters here, although that's something I think you can just um, probably take it, take offline. Um, so any any of our other speakers or, or VJ indeed, now that we've got 10 minutes or so before the break, is there anything you would like to maybe say that you didn't get to say or any particular um, answer uh, or question on the, the chat that might require a wee bit of elaboration or stuff coming in here? Now, uh, just quick one, there are one question I answer, uh, see here. How does the conversion of existing redundant machine compare to the construction of a new synchronous compound? Can, if you don't mind, can I answer that? Of course. Yeah, so uh, see the uh, existing machines, they were usually existing generator are designed for different level of short circuit level uh, and inertia. So when you are put looking at, uh, they can be used, but they may not be able to offer the same level of short circuit level as synchronous com condenser, it likely to be lesser. And again, there will be limitations on size of flywheel because the foundations being built in the past may not have taken the consideration of the large rotating mass on that. So it is a case specific, but happy to look into each case and give give uh, advice. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, VJ. So I don't I think these questions may have been kind of grouped by conversation as opposed to just chronologically. Is that correct? Yes, they have come across just uh, on the screen. As as then been asked. I'm just, we've got some sh screen sharing just now at the moment. I mean, I mean, my screen run out, so I have put all questions in chronological order, starting from Solomon, who was the first one, and so on. So uh, if you want, you can, you can go through the questions or just uh, in the ones that we haven't uh, replied yet uh, because of uh, time restrictions. Uh, I will see yeah. I think the, the issue that I have as is, is chair is that some of the questions have been answered, some haven't been. So it's hard for me to, to, to look at that and figure that out in the, the time that we have available. So I'm I'm, I'm wondering, um, well, there's a couple of questions that have just come in here. Um, there is another question. I, 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 I know the questions are to me, Campbell, if, if you yeah. okay, I can answer those. For that, yeah, because you, you haven't had the chance to respond via the chat, so perhaps we can spend a couple of minutes on those questions. That would be good. Yeah. Another question, Bina, has the design of synchronous condenser and flywheel evolved in recent time, or is it the same design concept through decades? Uh, a very good question. So uh, historically, it, uh, any synchronous machine was offering the services. Uh, as we move into the energy transition or net zero, where the large share of renewable is there, the falling short circuit level, it means the synchronous condenser design has evolved to offer either short circuit level or optimize the design to offer more short circuit level. And the size of the synchronous condenser has gone bigger than what it historically used to be. 
uh, I mean, recent example and Ruri is uh, probably discussed about the money point and I have Siemens are the one of the one who who've been working on that project uh, and supporting um, Rory's, uh, Rory uh, with the project. So yeah, it has been uh, changed over a period of time. Thank you. Great. Thanks, um, VJ. There's a couple other. I think there's, I can see one question there from Seamus, um, which is about to you, VJ. Could you elaborate on why a transformer impedance should be different for a synchronous condenser than it is for a normal uh, generator? Yeah, but, but you're talking about when you, if you see in a very non-technical way, you're looking at the machine which for a fault going to inject a lot of short circuit current. It means your winding is going to be thicker. Yeah. Uh, it means you got a large machine sitting there, which uh, which is going to uh, uh, feeding the fault. Uh, it means your uh, impedance of the transformer should be should justify uh, injection of that current, and that's why when you design the whole system, you will see the impedance of the transformer is low. You can also have a high impedance transformer, such as tertiary winding transformers has been asked. Can we use the existing tertiary winding? Yes, you can use, but then it cannot give the short circuit level you're looking for to offer at a given price. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. There was a question that I asked of, or, or maybe more of a comment that I'm not sure if anyone directly responded and I, I, I genuinely I, I don't know I mean this might be a, a silly question but you know if, if a if a synchronous uh, compensator or condenser provides inertia and there's a frequency dip in the system and the frequency still drops significantly clearly it might the rate of change of frequency might be slowed down but as the system is beginning to accelerate does that is the is it disconnected or is it accelerated up with the rest of the system? Because I suppose if it's accelerating up with the rest of the system, it's providing a bit of a drag as the system's trying to return to nominal system frequency, or perhaps the friction is so low that it's it's not an appreciable appreciable real power load when it's accelerating. I don't know if anybody's thought of that one. I can uh, happily uh, explain my understanding of this, uh, and anyone else can jump in yep. uh, who. Uh, so, so when we're talking about large rotating mass, it has potential to store that much energy. Uh, when rate of change of frequency has changed and there was a sudden dip and that dip has been recovered. This now during that dip, the, the rotor has provided all the kinetic energy uh, or, uh, and now it is start absorbing that again. So I think uh, synchronous condenser as per technologies, uh, the best device to when, when we are out of the dip, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, but I think Seamus has just added there on the on the uh, the chat as well. I don't know, Seamus, if you want to say anything to elaborate on that. Uh, only I believe your instinct is exactly right that uh, inertia is all about controlling rate of change of frequency, and it will reduce the rate of change of frequency, whether that's upwards or downwards. Yeah. Can Can I add to that? Um, from a from a system perspective, that's not necessarily always a a bad thing, though, because when you are, um, you, yeah. you basically, the point of inertia is to slow everything down, to dampen it out. So moving back towards nominal can be bad in terms of you can then get overshoots. So we may often see a, a low frequency event followed by a high frequency event. So yeah. it's not necessarily a bad thing that it's suppose, dampening everything down on the way up to. Suppose if you're on the way up, it does, it does suggest that, you know, on the way up towards nominal, it suggests that you're in a better situation. Than when you were on the way down because you've clearly got more active power than you've got demand whether that's through load shedding or just scheduling more power to come in so i suppose if the if the additional initial takes you a wee bit longer than it might have otherwise it's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you're getting there um yeah there's a good simple question from seamus how, how do, do you start, start a and that's a very good question how do you start a synchronous compensator you Static frequency controller, you um, it's nothing but a synchronous machine. So you you basically uh, take the power from the grid, uh, and uh, but what you're asking here, you need some kind of prime mover to rotate the shaft first. So yeah, you need some kind of uh, uh, mechanism. So we use static frequency converter to start the machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I suppose just another question for me, you know, in terms of the protection side of things. And again, quite a naive question, uh, you know, but if you've got a, a, a machine with a set of inertia, but in this case, it's not, I know that motors will generate fault current sometimes, 
But would would the, would this the short when you mentioned the, the short circuit level, is the the envelope? You know, you normally get that sort of sub synchronous sort of reactance driven. You get a peak, and then over a few cycles, it starts to reduce. Is that significantly different because of the fact that there is no prime mover, there's no steam turbine or something with its power going into it, even though you might not be able to extract much real power during a close-up short circuit? I'm just wondering if there's differences, because it's enough. It's one thing to talk about short circuit level, but it's another thing to talk about how sustained it might be when the protection and the circuit breakers might not operate for tens of milliseconds. I don't know if it's a concern at all. I cannot imagine your the envelope you're mentioning, so I might need the time to think about my answer on this. Put it in the chat anyway. I was just yeah. interested if there's lots of these in the system. Does it actually change somehow the the make or break capacities, or or you know how long it might be sustained for? Yeah, probably similar to what machines would generate and are normally operating in motor mode. Um. Oh. There was another one of the damper bars. I, I, that's a good point. Uh, we used to use damper bars in a smaller machine. I don't think you can use it in synchronous com condenser uh, the, because you already have a large rotor there. Adding damper bars is, is not good for design. So uh, we have a, we'll, we'll start a motor uh, with the frequency converter and then take it to the synchronous speed and then synchronize it with the grid. Yeah. And then you will keep the keep the motor or synchronous compensator running throughout its uh, 24 by 7, 365 days, apart from scheduled maintenance. Yeah, yeah. And there's a couple of really good, I think, questions and perhaps even food for thought while we're getting our coffees or maybe nightcaps, depending on what part of the world you're in, um, or early morning breakfast. But, um, you know, if anyone has any thoughts on black start capability uh, in relation to inertia, and I suppose this whole future uh, system scenario that we're going to, and then, you know, what are the research areas to focus on in this space to meet net zero? So short questions, but with per potentially very long answers, but, you know, in the minute or so that we've got left, does anybody want to, any of the panellists want to say anything about that? Yeah, Rory here. I can't see its use as black start. I mean, but particularly money point to start the unit, you need 10 megawatts approximately because yeah. the large mass, which probably wouldn't help the system in a black start. Mm. Um, so you'd have to run it up to that speed. So you need power to do that, yep. which I wouldn't so recommend. It's, a, it's arguable if we had a proliferation of these through the system, you might not be able to bring them on until you've got significant excess power V demand. So I suppose one thing it could potentially do is extend the period as you, you're starting to restore the system. That's that's maybe something that we could take. And then what about the research areas to focus on? I, I should know this as an academic, but I don't think it's my place, but I'm very interested and in maybe, maybe people can add more to this chat in the next session around that one. But I think that's a great question, you know, particularly from the practitioners here, the manufacturers, the system operators, I think it's... Uh, that's a very good question. So I don't know if anybody's got anything to say in closing for that. We've got about one minute left before the chat, before the call. One, one more question, Campbell. Uh, some uh, Razwan has asked, synchronous condenser usually achieve about 50% of the nameplate rating on the MVR in mm -hmm. post absorption side due to excitation arrangement. Do you have a synchron con synchronous condenser solution that can achieve larger range on the import absorption side? Uh, yes, of course we can. We can. One can design uh, uh, import absorption side, uh, but then it is a. You can either compromise on the reactive power MVR or you can on the short circuit level. So you will have to make a, a judgment call depending on what you were looking for in the solution. The solution can be designed. Yes. And I, I'm aware. I'm aware that sometimes synchronous compensators could even be co-located with a stack com, so you've maybe got a bit of a hybrid um, solution there for the reactive power specific side of things. So I think that brings us nicely up to the uh, time for a coffee break. So I make that just going on for uh, two thirty-six or three thirty-six according to the uh, Central European time. So we have about ten minutes for break. So if I can ask you to all come back in ten minutes, we'll get started on the, the second half of today, which is. Uh, we're moving on to looking at the grid forming um, and system support and behaviour of converters and generators. So I'll see you in 10 minutes. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.
can share your screen, uh, Michael, um, if you if you want to get get it, get it lined up. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I think that's us back on time. Um, so welcome to anyone who has just joined us um, for the second um, part of the of the uh, event on inertia and and grid forming, um, which is a short name for it. So we're now into the second half after having a very vibrant and interesting first half. So our first speaker is uh, Michael Fetty. Hopefully I pronounced your surname correctly, Michael. Um, and this is on grid forming and system support and behaviour of, of generation plants. So if you can get your screen sharing going, Michael, and again, if I can ask all of our speakers to try to stay to the allocated time, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you. I hope the, you can see my screen. Yep. Okay, thanks. So it is a uh, work of a group of experts we have done at VDE in Germany in the last two, three, up to three, maybe a little bit more than three years. And uh, we are at the moment we finished the guideline for grid performing and grid supporting behavior of PGMs. Uh, it is uh, mainly focused on the topic that uh, we will lose a lot of classical power stations in the next future. We have these uh, exit from coal fired engines uh, and from nuclear power plants and so on. We are in the way to implement much more uh, type two devices, so inverter based technologies. And so we have the big question to solve how to support stability for the complete system. So, and uh, therefore, well, come on, babe, next slide. Uh, a little bit about our content. We are discussing about the principles for the system stability. We, we are discussing about system supporting requirements beyond primary control and grid forming characteristics for type one PGMs, system supporting characteristics for type two PGMs, and some ideas about the next step. Let me say we are in the middle of our work. It's uh, not the final step we have made, but it is the first step. The next is uh, how to set up the test procedures for everything and to change the test procedures. You will see why and how we should do that. So the question is, uh, we have a big problem. Let me say the problem is that uh, the actual machines in the grid are not able to support some all the topics we need to get for stability actions. Let me say they are mostly uh, directed into uh, a control strategy to support the grid with the maximum feed in power into the grid, but not to be a part of the control of the frequency of the, of the grid. So, and therefore we are discussed about that all future and current inverter based PGMs following the current TCR requirements have a current source characteristic and due to their control strategy. And let me say the classical machines are also, the synchronous machines are also in machines we are work in parallel, but uh, does not support the frequency control in the complete range. So, in general, the synchronous generator provides a sinusoidal voltage at the connection point, and that means, uh, as we discussed in some lessons before, that means in the sense of inertia and grid forming properties of the synchronous generators, and to the inverter-based PGMs can contribute a stable and sufficiently damped frequency and voltage control. At the end, the system stability can only be ensured by running enough PGM with grid forming properties in the grid. This particularly applies for changes in the network configuration, such as disturbance-induced separate network formation. So it's a question how many of these not stability supporting PGMs do we allow within the grid and how many of the others we need? So the first is a prerequisite for a stable network operation outside the frequency range and market-based primary control is the capability to compensate for disturbances and active power balance within the PCMB frequency ranges and to subsequently maintain the network frequency to a stable operating point. 
So, and the contribution to the primary control based on network security can be object to limitations depending on the respective type of power generations of type one or type two TGMs and on power generation technology. So, and the PDM shall be capable of stable operation in fictitious island network operation. The, the name fictitious island network operation will be very important in the next topic we have to discuss. So, we are looking at the following. Very brief in the definition. The grid under the grid forming, we discuss the fundamental capability of a maintaining is of a stable operating point with constant voltage and frequency during, during a hypothetical standalone operation. So stability must also be maintained to define disturbances with steady state and dynamic deviations from the operating point. That simply means we have controllers inside which can deal with the conditions. And system supporting entails the design of control devices for active and reactive power balancing at the connection point such that the plant supports network stability beyond the connection point without having grid forming characteristics. These characteristics must be provided by other PGUs without being unduly impaired by the system supporting PGU. Exclusively, system supporting characteristics are only permissible to a very limited extent. It simply says the one great form. Did, did you ask please? please? Did you ask him? No, I think you can continue, Michael. I'm not sure if someone's maybe just. Can you read your lines if you're not speaking, please. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't understand. But this is only uh, some noise in my my uh, earphone. Should I should I go further? Or? Yeah, please what continue. Question. I don't think there was a question. Okay. Just continue. Thanks. Okay. Thank so. When we made our job, we have a lot of discussions with the manufacturers. Why? If you want to find out about the, the quality and the properties of the used controllers of the distinct plants, of the distinct technologies which are connected to the grid, in the past or at the moment, we are testing and looking for the open loop characteristics. So, but we are interested in the closed loop characteristics. So we must ensure that in the situation when we lose short circuit ratio, when this will be go down, we lose short circuit power within the grid, that everything will be operate in the proper sense. So simply, there is one new, a new, it's not a new uh, pronunciation, but we're looking exactly for the damping about the characteristics which each controlled unit could be support to the grid. So uh, the, therefore we asked the manufacturers, how good are and how able are your uh, plants, your PGMs, and how could they support the grid? And in which case should they do that? And uh, which is the portion of damping they can add to the grid behavior? So and these are questions which are very difficult to answer. And we know from the manufacturers that some of the manufacturers have no idea about the about answering these kind of questions, since they have, especially the smaller manufacturers or sort of smaller plants of inverter-based plants have uh, never tested them or never measured them in the complete range. What does it mean in the closed loop behavior? Everything is tested in the in, in, in the, the fabric. Everything is tested under the conditions we have to do uh, to establish at the moment. So, but we want to know it. What does it work? Uh, how does it work in the future? And does it work in the sense that we lose short circuit ratio? That the grid will be more weak than today, we lose inertia. And therefore, it is possible that the different plants will be operated and support the grid supporting and forming with their kind of technologies. So, a lot of discussions, more than one year, 
about this discussions about this table is only a small extract of the table. We want to set up these for a lot of distinct uh, generators and PGMs uh, so that we can exactly know which kind of technology can su support uh, our grid in the future. So therefore, we make the following discussion. We said we set up a fictitious grid islanding network that you see, we have a separated transmission or distribution grid, open circuit breaker, a simulation model, so the bus bar, our test object, and the test object get the base load and the variable load. And so under certain different conditions, the test object must show that the controller will work and that the desired damping ratio will be fulfilled. And the system is stable and the controller works as it should. So this is therefore a fictitious grid. So fictitious means it is similar, it is separated from the others. And if it's a synchronous generator, it fulfills that, but we want to test the controllers. The next step is if we have system supporting characteristics, it's very important to know that we have a little bit different test bed for these. So it simply says, we have the test machine, the inverter, we have the base load, the variable load, and we have a variable impedance and a synchronous generator model. It is a model which gives only inertia. So they have a rest system, a basic system with a less inertia in, the, in this test bed so that we can test if the controllers of the type two machines will also fulfill the conditions we want to see in the future. So the proposal is compliance verification with the requirements for PCNB on the fictitious standalone grid with provided synchronous machine type one PGU. The model of type one PGU is, is to be limited to consideration of the nominal power, short circuit power and mechanical equation of motion. And chapter six means it is a chapter of our German rule of that. Due to the resulting lack of islanding capability of the frequency and voltage control loops, uh, current TCRs have no grid forming requirements. I said for the type two, it is not possible to prove the participation of type two units in the PCNB and islanding operation. So we want to do this and to test these in this arrangement in the future. Therefore, we set up this arrangement, let me say, as a test bed. So this is fine. The journey is just starting. You may see at these. We have a lot of follow-up work to fulfill in the German guidelines in the future. We have to determine parameters for the properties in the active power setting ranges for individual generation technologies. We have to final elaborate of the certification, including simplified procedure, procedures in the low voltage grid. We have some upcoming tasks, the technical groundwork for the provision of instantaneous reserve, including grid forming and future auxiliary services, support of future development of TCRs and implementation of the network code RFG 2.0, so that we get a contribution of these and to see how it should work from the NCOE perspective. All relevant stakeholders are involved in the VDN, VDE, FNN. It is very close in cooperation with the German government. The uh, BMWK is the Ministry for Economics and Climate, and the German regulator, reg regulator uh, the BNETS A, to support uh, rapid implementation of capabilities for grid users to support system stability. And this is we are working on, and so that the result of these guideline is now discussing and the distinct groups for the distinct voltage levels to establish a revision or the next revision of the uh, guidelines for the different grid levels. Okay, you see, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work done, and but we are just starting the journey. And thank you for your attention. Many questions will be receivable from you and we hope we can answer everything of this. Many thanks to Salome Gonzalez who helped me in the preparation of these some slides. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Michael, and th thanks to Salome as well. Um, so there'll, there'll be a couple of questions, I'm sure, in the chat. I can see one already, and feel free to continue asking. But just as with the first session, I think we'll pass straight on to our next um, set of speakers. So I'm not sure here if this is a bit of a two interrelated individual presentations, um, but we've got something about research collaboration and demonstrations of grid form and control by energy storage systems. Um, and this is from uh, Deepak uh, Rama Subramanian and Wenzon Wang of EPRI, and uh, I think Thibaut Prevo um, from, from RTE is also maybe going to be doing the second talk or the second part of this uh, articulated talk. So if I could ask my colleagues to please start screen sharing and get started. So there's, there's 15 minutes for each of these parts of the talk. Thank you. Thanks, Campbell. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So thanks. Yeah. So it, it's uh, the the way we have structured this is from Wenzong and my side will provide a little bit of perspective regarding grid forming inverter specifications that we've been working on, uh, and Thibo uh, will provide a perspective from some synchronization capability work that they have been doing at RTE. And the goal is here to try to converge on uh, some kind of uh, scenario wherein we can. Uh, look at it from the perspective of without really knowing what is the control type inside the inverter, grid forming inverter, uh, we can have a performance derived. So uh, just to confirm, are you able to see the screen in slideshow mode? Yeah, it's perfect, Deepak, thanks. Thanks, Campbell, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be, it's going to be a joint presentation between my colleague Wenzong and myself. And the way we are approaching this from the perspective of grid forming inverters from an EPRI side is looking at it from the perspective of not necessarily voltage source versus current source. Those are critical components. Those are critical behavioral characteristics that do play a role. But at the fundamental level, when we look at it from the uh, system plan or system operator scenario, uh, what we essentially want is a future inverter which can operate both with and without synchronous machines, it can operate with other inverters, uh, provides positive contribution to load generation balancing, positive contribution to voltage control, has robust fault right through, provides contribution to system stability margin, and provides a positive contribution to power quality. And it has to be capable of doing all of this while meeting its equipment limits and while also meeting uh, acceptable metrics that we have from a system reliability perspective. So, as an example, uh, unless the inverter is designed to provide, say, six per unit fault current, uh, it may be unrealistic to expect a grid forming inverter to provide six per unit fault current uh, just by default of its maybe voltage source operation. Uh, and a subset of that would then be grid forming inverters that can be designated as black start resources. So we want to try to distinguish or differentiate between a grid forming resource that is black start capable and a grid forming resource that is not black start capable. Just like how for synchronous machines, we differentiate between a synchronous machine resource, which is a black start capable unit, and a synchronous machine resource, which is a not black start capable unit. So uh, we want to go along that lines. We recognize that there are more nuances involved with each of these bubbles here, uh, and we're focusing on looking at expanding each of those nuances, but uh, look at it from a top down structure where we are able to define these high level bubbles from a system planner perspective, and then we go down the, the road from there. So if we have to do that from a system planner perspective, then what our research has shown is that a 100% current source network can still operate. So uh, trying to really look at it from the aspect of voltage source behavior, current source behavior, and we've seen that Kirchhoff's law, Ohm's law, it still exists, it still is valid when we go to a 100% current source network. So for example, Kirchhoff's current law doesn't, auto, doesn't suddenly vanish when you have a network which has only current sources. But what is important there is how that current source, which is a dependent current source, is tuned. How is it designed to behave? And how is it designed to operate when you have system events occurring? And when you have changes occurring in the system, how do you change this injection of current that you're bringing out from that current source? Now, a lot of today's inverters may be designed and tuned for strong operation, but uh, in those strong operation design of these inverters, uh, a PLL is only part of the control structure that is used to obtain synchronization. And when an instability occurs, that's not the sole cause of instability in weak grids because it depends upon how that PLL is behaving with the other controls in the network 
and it's not just the uh, the, the, the uh, sole blame, so to speak, of an instability uh, shouldn't just be on the PLL. And what that results in is that if an inverter actually does have a PLL, but if it is controlled in a manner in which the current being injected by that inverter is appropriately designed, then that can continue to operate in a strong grid and a weak grid and 100% inverter grid. So the presence or absence of a PLL shouldn't be the distinguishing factor between a grid forming or a grid following inverter because it depends upon how these devices are controlled and what kind of functionality and service that they're providing to the rest of the network. That is what is important. And if we go along that route, then it, we have to really look at it from a performance-based approach because at the end of the day, a system planner requires a set of performances from these inverters in their network because they essentially want these inverters to provide services they want these inverters to provide a set of current injections, as we've been seeing also in the inertia section. So if we keep our de definitions, if we keep our specifications from this performance-based approach, uh, then maybe we can go towards a control agnostic definition uh, of the inverter. And one example, as we showed about this PLL not being the sole cause is shown here, that if you actually take an existing inverter, which has both uh, inner loop and an outer loop, and you have the very classical control, vector control, where you have current control and PLL, you actually start seeing that if you have P and Q control at the back end, so essentially the currents that are being injected are governed to try to inject a fixed value of Q, then as the short circuit strength reduces, you start seeing instabilities, as we have seen in a lot of our research work and uh, a lot of publications. But what we observe is if in the same structure, if we keep everything the same in the inner loop, but all that we change is we go from this Q control to a V control in the inner loop, then transitioning to this fast inverter level voltage control actually makes the resource be stable in very low short circuit ratios uh, and can even be stable when you have only 100% inverters. Now, this is not to say that every PLL based system will be stable in these conditions. Control tuning, con excuse me, control design does play a crucial role. But what it is to say is that the fact that by having a PLL also, you can derive and you can bring about the stability throws light to the importance of having this level of voltage control on the inverter level side rather than having Q control. And then that becomes a distinguishing factor for grid forming property uh, or for grid forming performance. And if we take that one step further, and if we compare it with say standards like 2800, 2022, which is the recent standard which has been approved uh, for bulk power system connected inverter based resources. And we look at that standard from the perspective of uh, what is the minimum step response time for voltage that is prescribed in that standard. And the minimum step response time is one second. And if we look at the same uh, kind of results where you have a source connected to a network and you start lowering short circuit strength at a short circuit strength of one, and if you have a step reduction of voltage of 0.1 per unit, what we start seeing is we start need to go towards a faster voltage control loop. We start need to going towards a more robust voltage control loop in order to bring about this stability at this uh, low short circuit strength scenario. Now, some of this might be inherently embedded into other types of control techniques for grid farming, but the property that is coming out is this fast voltage control. And that is what we want to recognize because once we recognize that this is the property, we can derive specifications around it. So for an example here, we say that the step response time should be less than the closed loop step response time, so the settling time here should be less than one second, uh, and that can enable the stability of the system uh, in this low short circuit environment. And there are a few uh, links to some publications that can uh, provide a little bit more insight on that. And if we take that specification, if we take that baseline about performance in the perspective of voltage control, performance in the perspective of fast voltage control, and then we compare it against different grid forming inverter implementations. So here we have compared five different grid forming inverter implementations, uh, going from virtual oscillator, group based, PLL based, and even a couple of them that we intentionally did look under the hood because we just wanted to see, supposing I don't know as a system planner, I don't know what is inside the hood, but what is the performance that is derived or provided by that unknown grid forming inverter implementation. And we see that even in the basic sense, without additional fine tuning, there's a very coarse level of tuning that is done. Without that additional fine tuning, there is a similarity in the transient performance across these five different types of grid forming characteristics. 
And from the uh, US North American perspective, there are FERC orders like 842 and 828, which have started already asking for this kind of capability in bulk power system connect connected inverter based resources. So maybe we can build upon that to further look at different specifications uh, that we can derive for uh, large system connected resources and then get the similar performance across multiple different performing control installations or implementations, uh, which is then that uh, makes the transmission planner uh, be agnostic to the type of grid forming implementation uh, that is being provided. And this can be then translated to positive sequence domain also, wherein it's not just the EMT domain behavior, but the positive sequence domain behavior in a software like PSSE, uh, which is used a lot uh, around the world for positive sequence studies, we looked at the comparison of response between a 100% inverter system with a grid forming inverter versus a 99% inverter system with a synchronous condenser. And once we looked at the response, we can see that because we are designing the inverter, because we are designing the controls, tuning the controls to meet a set of performance requirements, and once we do that, uh, we can see that we get superior performance with the grid forming inverter, uh, both for a routine generation trip and for an extreme generation trip as compared to the synchronous condenser uh, in, in this positive sequence environment. And the results are numerically robust and there's uh, no, no kind of uh, non-convergence that is uh, obtained. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that this will directly translate to every other system because each system has its own unique property and we have to see how to apply these models in those various systems uh, before we can make a determination. But the fact that the model exists is an encouraging uh, scenario here, allowing transmission planners to be able to do uh, large system studies very quickly. And this can now, so this was all from the transmission system perspective. We can then transition to the distribution system microgrid perspective also and try to define similar kinds of requirements and similar kinds of specifications uh, for grid forming inverters. If you look at a typical utility level microgrid design process today, and here, utility level microgrid means a microgrid that involves at least part of the medium voltage feeder and different generation resources and customers connected at different locations. At the end of the very first step, which is the design phase, there will be requests for proposals, RFPs, that's to be issued for grid forming plant within which the performance requirement for the grid forming plant and the inverter will be developed. And the goal with those requirements is to really ensure adequate power quality and reliability in the utility scale microgrid. And developing functional requirements of the grid forming plant is really a key part to in order to achieve that. Next slide, Deepak. If you look at a typical um, grid forming requirements, that's in an example RFP which is taken from a microgrid example in the United States, as you can see on the left-hand side. It's very high level, so it requires black star capability, voltage frequency regulation, phase balancing, but there's no details about what the inverter should do or should behave like in order to, to achieve those. So what we're trying to do here is to dig into those areas and really look at what um, specifically can be required for the grid forming inverter in terms of its performance to achieve those areas. For example, if we take the phase balancing, then the grid forming inverter should be able to regulate its voltage and balance at its RPA, which is the reference point of applicability, commonly at the PCC, to be less than a certain percentage. And at the same time, we also need to require the capability on the negative sequence current to be greater than a certain percentage. And of course, these uh, specific numerical values will need to come from studies of certain or specific microgrids, but um, the, the way to set up the requirements um, is what we are investigating. One more quick, Deepak. With this side of uh, more detailed requirements, we envision that it will help to reduce the cost and time needed for microgrid design, and it will also motivate the OEMs to offer better products. And of course, this development of these requirements will, will need to seek feedback from OEMs because we don't want to develop requirements that no indoor can achieve. Next slide, Deepak. So these are a summary of what we are, what we have looked at and what we are looking at right now. So the areas that we have researched on are 
up to now are mainly on related to the steady state behavior, including the readings, the voltage harmonics and balance, the frequency voltage range, and what's under development are more on the dynamic and fault behavior side. Back to you, Tipa. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so in that note, I just wanted to uh, provide a little bit of uh, insight into where we are going with this further and, and what is the next stage. Deepak, where are... Deepak yes, I'm Campbell. sorry to interrupt, but that's almost your time. So if you can make this extremely quick. Um, we Exa can't nope. time. One no more worries at all, Campbell. Okay. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, we have set up a consortium here in North America uh, called the Unify Consortium, which is co-led by ECRI, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and University of Washington. It's a consortium which consists of a diverse set of universities, diverse set of industry, utilities and system operators, national labs and research institutes, to further look at this topic of performing inverters, to further see where we can go further from this, uh, and derive specifications, derive models, capabilities, test beds, standards, uh, and so on. So uh, if you're interested in knowing more about this consortium and uh, being a participant, uh, please do let me know uh, and I would be happy to uh, connect with you. Uh, with that, uh, thanks Campbell, that, that's all we had. Sorry, I, I lost my mouse for a few seconds there trying to unmute. Um, so thanks very much Deepak and, and Wenzong for that. Um, that was a really interesting talk and I'm sure it's going to trigger a lot of uh, questions. So I'm going to move on now to our next speaker, uh, Thibaut Prevo from RTE in France, and he's going to talk to us about some demonstration um, using energy, energy storage for grid forming control. Thanks very much Thibaut, over to you. Thanks very much for the introduction. Can you see my uh, screen correctly? Yeah. And can you hear me fine? It's yeah. great. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, I'm going to talk a bit about a uh, uh, EU project named Osmosi. It's just uh, ending right now, and especially about World Packet 3, about demonstration of grid forming. Uh, just a bit of uh, agenda so introduction about the two demos that we have in the context of the project and then we'll talk about the rte so and ing team so ing team is a spanish manufacturer of inverters and the the second demo which is a more a university based of in epfl in switzerland uh, using already existing battery and inverter so this is osmosi project is a uh, based in fact upon the migrate project, especially work package three, where we define in fact different controls of grid forming, we define the system needs, and we have a very first rough definition of what grid forming should be. Uh, now we have many more controls grid forming in the literature. We have examples of high power demonstration. We also have a grid codes in, in GB. Uh, so we have advanced a lot uh, in grid forming now, but uh, I mean, this project started four years ago now, so the objective were to progress on the common understanding and in fact also on the definition of this grid forming capability. It's also very much in line with what uh, Deepak mentioned in his previous presentation. In Migrate, we were very much control oriented. Now we try to see how we can define grid forming based on uh, grid requirements, I would say, or performances. So the objective were to define, to, to shows that we can uh, provide grid forming capability with commercially available uh, energy storage system, that it can be deployed uh, without oversizing and that the, the control uh, performances can be assessed without in fact knowing the control, just with external measurements. So we had, as I said, we had two demo, uh, one with just battery and an inverter, uh, existing one, so it's a uh, very limited controls and one that has been built from scratch with a specification in the project where we had inverter batteries, but also super caps. Uh, so hybrid DC storage uh, to try to improve the behavior. So in fact, how the contribution went in, in this project, in fact, we started the specification between RTE and NG team, the control design of this AC DC inverter uh, also, a specific design of this DC-DC converter to allow for uh, power sharing between battery and super caps. Then the testing in the lab. 
then EPFL, in fact, built upon that this uh, multi-service optimization because the aim was also to show that grid farming is not something that in its own, I mean, it can be embedded in, into existing units that would provide other kind of services. And the last one was performance assessment without knowing the control. Uh, so it's a European project, so all the deliverables are now public. You can just click on the link and get at them for free if you are interested. Uh, okay, let me pass through this slide. So grid forming unique, in fact, we at least in our project, we consider that it should not be oversight, so it should provide uh, within its power and current a self-synchronization services, uh, standalone and so, sorry, provide synchronization services and be able to self synchronize. So, it does not rely on specific grid condition to synchronize and can operate on a wide range of, of ratio. What we call it here synchronization services is, in fact, the very, very fast services. So, we can say natural, inherent, immediate. Uh, it's basically what we call synchronizing power, the system strength for current and inertia. We'll go through that just later. So, in fact, these units they will maintain and but also help other units to maintain synchronism uh, on the grid. Uh, and yeah, again, we don't want any overload or, or capacity reservation to be able to provide this grid forming. We want to make best use of what's already available to, in fact, to reduce the cost and to ensure that a lot of units will be able to provide such uh, capability. So, in fact, this is a uh, a figure that you probably all know, we have uh, this, all these uh, frequency services. Uh, this uh, synchronization services, in fact, are the very fast ones, the ones that go between zero and I would say 250 milliseconds, maybe and maybe up to two seconds. So this is hard and non-frequency ancillary services are, are uh, dispatched today, I would say, at least in, in Europe. We have this uh, voltage control, we have black start capability, island operation. Then if we go to a bit faster control with this fast reactive current uh, injection, so the same as short circuit current, we also have this uh, uh, virtual inertia. Uh, what we would like to add on top of that is this stability services. So we would like also to have this very fast voltage support because inverters are, can very easily provide that. And we want to add this synchronization services with very, very fast activation time, uh, but also very low sustained time. So we are talking here about seconds, few seconds. So this forward current, forward current is uh, self-explaining with the system strength. When you have a, a change in the amplitude of the voltage, uh, you need to provide reactive current. If synchronizing power, if when you have a, a step in the angle and standalone capability also, here doesn't is very different from black start because we are not talking about being able to provide enough energy to the to the island is just to be able to continue operation for a few uh, seconds or early and, and having, for example, a decreasing frequency to provide the signal to the others that the, this island has been split from the rest of the system. So what we try to also to propose is kind of, uh, of uh, progressive grid forming requirement with the type one, which that would be uh, the would, would say it's the cheapest one, everybody could do that uh, because it's just that you have the capability to stand alone to provide some reactive uh, current immediately if there is an amplitude drop. And what we call low fault current is just that you provide a quick fault current, but just within your capability. And you can operate for a wide range of short circuit ratio. So you, you would need that uh, when the system strength locally decreases and it's almost no cost because it's just software upgrade. Then if you add on top of that some synchronizing power profile, so it means when the, the phase uh, or the angle just have a step, you need to provide active current. Uh, you need that when the system inertia locally decreases and the cost is also quite limited because you just need a buffer of energy for, for one second, let's say. And here again, we assume that all the other frequency services will be delivered by somewhere else, or it might be by the same, but it's not mandatory. Then type three would be the same, but with inertial response. So inertial response is the same, but you would need more energy stored because the inertial response will last for a few seconds. You you would need su such kind of, of type three uh, grid forming when the system inertia 
globally decreases. Uh, and you have this type four uh, grid forming, which I, in fact are type three with very high fault current. So this is needed when traditional uh, protection fails to detect fault and you can't uh, upgrade the, the protection scheme. Uh, basically, it would be synchronous machine. Uh, we like this approach because it's uh, also based on the constraint that you meet in the grid. So you would it would be easy for you to, for a system operator to require this different type of grid forming. And it also goes from cheap solution to more expensive one. Uh, so the demo that has been done by uh, NJ team and RTE, as I said, it's a hybrid with a lithium ion and ultra caps. Uh, unfortunately, there was a fire incident during commissioning. So we have mainly a factory acceptance test, but no test on site because they were done just, I mean, the tests that we had were just and just before commissioning and it lasts just for a few days. Uh, so this is a structure. We have this AC DC control with four, uh, sorry, three DC DC inverters and batteries and different ultra caps. Uh, if we go to what, what has been done there, I believe one of the main impact, main difference with uh, the migrate control is that we have a negative sequence control added on top of the threshold virtual impedance, which means we can deal with unbalanced condition and unbalanced faults. You can also, in fact, set how much positive negative sequence you want. If you want more uh, uh, positive uh, voltage, I mean, a balanced voltage or balanced current, uh, there is also the, the control that has been decoupled. So we have this grid forming uh, control that can be just uh, delivered for a few uh, seconds and completely decorrelated from traditional frequency services. So we call that transient grid forming, but it does not require a lot of energy to be stored, to be provided and still stabilizing the grid. Uh, we also have a specific DC-DC control design that allows to uh, make, in fact, each kind of storage deliver the services that are most uh, fitted for. For example, the ultra caps can deliver the fast transient uh, while the battery can do the energy intensive ones. Uh, so these are the, the lab where the tests were carried out. Uh, in the report, you can find, I would say, most of the results that have been done in, in the factory acceptance tests. Uh, and if you don't find what you're looking for, please address an, an email. I think we can uh, share the, the missing ones. So these are, for example, a test in synchronizing power with different mode, all uh, with the three DC DC converter, which means battery plus ultra caps, or just battery or just ultra caps. We also have different inertial response with different emulated inertia and the this T uh, GF, which is in fact the transient grid forming uh, constant, which means that after two seconds, for example, this uh, the blue one is going back to the to the set point that was prior to the event. And we have this unbalanced fault where you can keep the voltage balance or the current balance, depending on the need you might have locally. Uh, just an overview of what has been done in EPFL. EPFL is a retrofitted an existing unit, which was not designed to be operated in grid forming. So they have this, they add this constant VF mode, they tweaked it a bit to have, uh, so still operating it, kind of black start mode with uh, uh, this droop control, so a constant for the power plus droop, but in grid forming mode. The thing is that they can't operate like that forever. Uh, so they have a mode bus controller that updates all the references every 200 milliseconds. Uh, eventually they develop some kind of uh, capability check uh, of the, the curve, because it's very easy to limit P and Q when you are green following, but you, when you are in grid forming, it's a bit more tricky. So they ensure that they don't, do not risk to hit the limit uh, every cycle and change the set points. And they add on top of this control uh, different, uh, different services. So for example, they have a dispatch tracking that they do every hour to change the PRF and QRF depending on the needs and uh, depending on the, the consumption uh, that was on the on the university feeder. And they also have a day ahead uh, forecast uh, so, they, so they, they can plan that they will have enough energy 
available to deliver the service all around the day. So it is very interesting to see that, in fact, the grid forming can be, in fact, put into an existing storage and deliver all the services that was delivered also before this grid forming. Another interesting part are the, the key performance indicator. As we said, we want to, defi to define and test the grid forming without knowing what's in the control. So they developed two kinds of indicators. One is a relative phase angle def difference deviation, and the other one is a relative rate of change of frequency. I think the relative rate of change of frequency is the most easiest one to understand. And in fact, we'll see that the results are very easy to understand too. So they were based uh, using measurement from FPA, GA, PMU. So it's a, a commercially available PMU. Uh, it's very accurate run, but commercially available. Thibault, you, you maybe only have around two minutes left, so if you yeah, can just uh, them, just... I have two slides left, so I'm good, Perfect. I think. Thank you. He, here is the difference between, uh, so let's focus on uh, relative Rockoff. We see that if you have a grid forming type of control, you have a much steeper uh, curve around zero, which means that, in fact, the, the frequency has been smoothed a lot and you just have very low Rockoff. So this is based on PMU measurement during, for example, hourly transients that occurred every every hour in Europe. Uh, uh, but they also did that to make more tests on a uh, real time model. So it's based on IEEE uh, 39 bus. Uh, it's uh, available if you wish at this address, uh, at this web address. And here we also see that we have a much steeper a curve if we go on grid forming. So one way to discriminate would be, for example, to have a shape here and ensure that your unit will not be, uh, uh, will be uh, as steep as uh, uh, the required one. Okay, uh, key takeaway, uh, let's, I, if I wanna go very fast through that, I think it was a negative sequence TVI uh, because it was, made to uh, work on real system where the voltage is not balanced. Uh, here we have demonstrated also that the type three, as we said, grid forming capability can be delivered by MVA scale uh, inverter that was just off the shelf one. And we have also indicators that are based on PMU measurements that can uh, capture the effect of this uh, battery uh, energy system and discriminate between what we would like to have grid forming and not and good following ones. Uh, thanks a lot. I hope I'm not too late. No, perfect. And thanks very much for that um, rapid roundup. Um, there was a lot in that, and I can see from the chat, this was quite a few questions that you maybe want to go and, and, and consider and maybe present some initial responses via the chat. So thanks very much again um, to, to Thibault. We're, we're now moving on to a session where we've got two speakers from pretty much the opposite ends of the world. Uh, our first is Nilesh, who is over in Australia. Nilesh Modi, who works in uh, the Australian Energy Market Operator, followed by Brian Lee, who's um, from Hawaii. So they could be anything up to 21 hours time zones apart. Um, one might be very early this morning, I think, in Hawaii uh, compared to my time. Another one could even be early tomorrow morning. So um, another benefit of one benefit of doing things via this virtual platform. So if I could ask Nilesh first, please, to talk about grid forming batteries. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Campbell. Let me see if you can hear me. Okay. Yeah, as long as you don't fall asleep. <laughs> no, it's still only 1.30 a.m. So. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. I hope you can see my screen uh, and the right screen. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, All right. Okay. Um, uh, Right, so let's kick it off. Uh, grid forming uh, batteries or inverters, a modeling control and application, which I'm planning to talk for next uh, 14 to 15 minutes. Uh, so the first one, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. We pay respect to their elders past, uh, present, and emerging. And the views expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter, that's me, and not necessarily those of AEMO. And the information in this presentation does not constitute legal, technical, or business advice. Before relying on it, you should make your own inquiry. And AEMO and the presenter are not liable uh, for any statements or representation in this presentation. 
or any omission from it or for any use or reliance on the information in it. Um, so this is the content I'm planning to cover in next uh, next uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, let me get this screen up. Okay. Uh, so let's jump into it. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, the batteries in the name. Uh, so I'm using this slide to set the scene where we are in terms of the transmission connected uh, batteries or installation of transmission connected batteries. The first one, uh, the large scale uh, battery that uh, was connected in Australia was back in 2017. It was 100 megawatt uh, with 128 megawatt of hour of storage. And at the time of connection, I understand it was the largest transmission connected lithium ion battery and popularly known as Tesla battery of South Australia. Uh, recently, it has been expanded to 150 megawatt, 194 megawatt hour, hour capacity. And currently, as we speak, we have 460 megawatt of transmission connected batteries operating in, in Australia. Not in distinct future, another 190 megawatt batteries will be online and that would bring us to a total of 750 megawatt of batteries in national electricity market of Australia, which is equivalent to a largest generating unit we have in Australia. And looking forward in near future, we have about 27 gigawatt of publicly announced battery and these are those who have not formally submitted application to connect but growing through the normal process of you know acquiring land and development approval etc cetera, etc cetera. and even half of it goes ahead it would be like an equivalent to few large power station heart of the press uh, is this uh, so last month late last month uh, following an announcement from origin energy to bring forward a closer of the coal power station known as Araring. Uh, the New South Wales government announced the development of 700 megawatt of battery with 1.4 gigawatt hour of storage. Um, and the, the installed capacity of this coal fire power station, which is retiring, is 2.88 gigawatt. If you are interested in following development of the grid connected batteries uh, in Australia, then I would like to point out to these two resources, one of which is maintained by AEMO. Okay, so let's jump into the grid forming batteries. Uh, the first one of the rank uh, is the Darampul Bass battery. Darampul Bass. Uh, um, it is the first transmission connected grid forming battery, as far as we know, installed in the National Electricity Market of Australia. Uh, it's connected to, uh, at the end of the long and radial 132 kV line alongside with 91 megawatt of wind farm and a local load approximately about 8 megawatt. Uh, this area is uh, exposed to lightning and outages and the installation of battery improves the reliability of the network. Uh, so we call this as a non-network solution. Uh, this battery also participates in the frequency control market. Uh, some of the features of these batteries, uh, it has shown that it can stably operate at very low source circuit levels. It has demonstrated a seamless transition from grid connected to an island mode during a plan and an unplanned event. Uh, it also provides a synthetic inertia response uh, uh, in next uh, next few slides. I'll show you how it responds. It has a short term overload capacity as well uh, to support the protection system around that part of the network. It's very small microgrid. It also participates in the system integrity protection scheme or, uh, or remedial action scheme often known as. As we understand, this battery operates in a virtual synchronous generator mode. Uh, in terms of its functionality, there are two levels of control, a primary and a secondary, and the heart of the primary controller is virtual synchronous generator mode. It is a combination of grid forming mode, synthetic inertia, frequency control, load of flux dynamics, and AVR. And this component emulates a synchronous generator during both steady state and transient conditions. The secondary control is more for site specific need, automation, and functional logic. And the synthetic inertia provided by battery is governed by the fundamental power transfer equation that is the voltage angle uh, dependent on the voltage angle difference between two nodes. Uh, um, no external measurement processing and the detection is required for most 
FFR or fast frequency response uh, from, from this battery. Uh, the voltage phaser has its own rotational speed and frequency and not following the grid frequency, but generate internally as an independent reference as a part of grid forming function. And based on the angle movement uh, uh, with the coupling point, the battery responds. Look at the response of the battery. This is uh, the response during an unplanned islanded event. Uh, uh, you can see uh, the, the red, uh, red vertical line is where the eye landing has uh, occurred. I'll try and point it out here. And you can see there is a smooth transition from the grid following to grid forming, or at least the formation of an island has successfully occurred. Uh, momentarily, it has also provided a higher fault current contribution momentarily as well. So, and it has demonstrated a stable operation of, uh, let's call it a microgrid. Uh, with a battery wind farm and local load and while it was uh, in an island mode it was island, uh, in an island operation you can see it was controlling the frequency in a very smooth manner i have only shown the frequency plot here if you are interested in uh, the, how the voltage was performing uh, i suggest you look at the reference which is available on the screen as well so this was the islanding event the response to an island event the next one is the response to a separation event so we had one incident when the whole south australian region was separated from the rest of the region and this is the response from the battery during the event uh, when the separation occurred uh, uh, the region was exporting that's why you see the frequency was going up and the battery started to absorb the megawatt and you can see a kind of inertial response which you would likely to see from a, a synchronous machine during the first second or two if you like yeah and then after the response was largely governed by the frequency control or ancillary service market requirement or we call it fks in australia so it's a combination of, of inertial response and the frequency response is shown on this slide the second grid forming battery that uh, I would like to talk about uh, or touch on is the Hornsdell Power Reserve. Uh, it has a virtual machine mode that allows the inverter to mimic the behavior of synchronous machine through a virtual machine component that runs in the in parallel with the conventional current source component. Like most grid following inverters under steady state system condition, the inverters behave behavior is driven by the current source component. The inverter produces the active and reactive currents in response or in accordance with the real and reactive power command received from side controller. When there is a disturbance, the active power uh, uh, response is proportional to the rate of change of frequency and the reactive power response is dependent, dependent on the change in the voltage. The machine characteristics such as inertia, stator, stator damper, are created synthetically in the inverter and these parameters are largely programmable unlike a traditional synchronous machine which has a fixed characteristic inherent to physical machine. Uh, this is the uh, real-time response uh, to an event uh, from HPR. Uh, while this event occurred, this, uh, this battery was trialing two inverters in a two different edge inertia constant. Uh, and uh, while the trial was ongoing, the event occurred. It 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 was an uh, uh, it was a, a frequency event, and the one the figure on the left side is the response from the inverter, and the figure on the right side is the response from the site. Now, when we look at the site response, most except two inverters, others inverters were in a grid following mode, while the two inverters were in grid forming mode. And you can see the the uh, the purple is the is the frequency, and the the the, uh, the other color is the response uh, from the inverter. Uh, when they are they were in a grid forming mode, the response was driven by rate of change of frequency. That is, the maximum megawatt is when the rate of change of frequency was higher. Let's call it. While it in a grid forming mode, the maximum megawatt you get it at the frequency nadir. So it wouldn't, wouldn't be dependent on the rate of change of frequency. 
I have used the this slide essentially to explain a concept that on the left hand side is the same figure which you have shown, uh, which you have seen in the previous slide. The blue one is the frequency, green one is the response from the inverter. But what I attempted to did is to calculate the rate of change of frequency based on the frequency measurements. They are discrete in here because uh, the measurements are, are kind of a discrete, which, which was provided to us at the time, the event. I calculated the 200 millisecond uh, uh, rate of change of frequency, the average rolling window. Again, one of many approach to calculate the rate of change of frequency. And the thing I did was to inverse the Y axis. So if you see the Y axis is not going from bottom to the top, top to the bottom. So when the rate of change of frequency is going in upward direction is actually the minus rate of change of frequency. And when the rate rock off is going downward direction is the positive rock off. And I've tried to align that with the response from the megawatt. And you can see that when the rate of change of frequency is higher, uh, the, the, uh, the, the response uh, uh, is, is, uh, is higher or, or larger response. And in the next slide, I try to compare uh, an example again, again, an example comparison between the synchronous machine response on the same day versus the response from one of the inverter. Again, the same concept on the right hand side, the megawatt versus the ray on, a, on, on the left uh, axis is the kilowatt, I would say kilowatt from the inverter in a grid forming mode. Y axis, again, an inverse Y axis. And, and, the, and the calculation is the rate of change of frequency on a 200 millisecond rolling window. And you can see the maximum or the higher output when the rate of change of frequency is higher. On the left hand side, you could see similar response, not exactly the same from a synchronous machine. Uh, when the, uh, the rate of change of frequency is higher, you get maximum megawatt coming out from, 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 uh, from the battery. Uh, after a few seconds, uh, it, the governor response kicks in, and that's why you don't see that exactly the same matching. And this is the last slide, uh, validation of the model. So this is the validation uh, of, a, of, a, of a, a grid forming model against the real time event. You can see, uh, sorry about the quality of this, uh, this graph, but uh, you can see the response, the, the and the response is in a blue, the real time response measured by L spec meter is in blue. And the reddish line is where the response is the response from the model. And they're largely aligning and two dotted line is kind of a 10% deviation from uh, from the response. And when we when um, when the re actual real time response was fed back in, the, the response coming out from the virtual machine mode inverter were largely aligning aligning with the real time uh, response. I think that's pretty much it what I had to cover uh, and thanks. Thanks for listening in. I will look into the chat and try and respond to those questions. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks Campbell. That was perfect. Nilesh. The, the, the timing was, was perfect. And again, thanks, thanks very much um, for staying up so late to, to, to share this with us. And if you can have a wee look at the, the chat, that would be really appreciated in any responses you can put in. There has been a few questions. So now we are uh, rapidly transiting to the other side of the. Well, let me think it's maybe not in so far in distance. It's really, really far in time zone. But anyway, we're going out into the Pacific now um, to visit Hawaii, I believe, or to be visited from Hawaii. So Brian, um, and again, I would imagine it's quite early where you are um, this morning. So uh, again, thanks very much for taking the time and, and over to you, please. Hello. Hi, Brian. Hi. Uh, sorry, can you quickly confirm with me uh, which screen you're looking at? I can see the slide editor view, not the slide show view. Okay, so this is the correct screen then. Okay, so hi, my name is sorry, Brian. Can you, can you manage to put it, Brian, could you put it onto the slide show mode? Because we can see all of your slides there, if you know what I mean. Oh, okay, gotcha. just to maximize the, the use of the screen if possible. Sometimes there's problems with this, but. So this is the correct screen now? It's still the editor view. Oh. And there's quite a bit of space used for the notes on it. So if you could get the slideshow view, it would be better. 
I don't know what's happening here. I think you may be sharing a screen as opposed to the application. I'm not sure. Yeah. Let me just share like a window. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there we go. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sorry, start again. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is Brian Lee. I'm a transmission planner at Hawaiian Electric, and I'll just go over today about some grid forming related work we're doing in uh, our transmission planning department. So I can't seem to control. Okay, sorry, there we go. Um, so here's an overview of what I'd like to share today. Uh, first is the current system generation mix, uh, what it looks like and our plans for the future. Um, some information on our integrated grid planning process. Um, some background on our latest renewable energy procurements and our findings that came out of the major system studies related to these large procurements regarding grid following and grid forming IVRs. And then I'll just go over some grid forming related work um, that we've been involved in. So for those who aren't familiar with Hawaiian Electric, I'll just briefly go over what our systems are like. So we have three major islands, Oahu, Maui, and Hawaii Island, each with separate and isolated power grids. Uh, so there are no tie lines between each island's grid and each island is currently dependent on their own generating resources. Uh, we also manage two small islands, but I will not be discussing those. Um, peak load on each island is about 1.1 gigawatts on Oahu, 200 megawatts for Maui and 200 megawatts for Hawaii Island. Uh, our goal for the future is 100% renewables by 2045. So back in 2015, our state made a commitment uh, to a clean energy future by getting to 100% renewables by 2045. And the measurement is the Renewable Portfolio Standard or RPS in percentage. Uh, it defines the percentage of energy that must be generated from renewable energy resources. Um, in addition to the 2045 milestone, we also have intermediate benchmark years um, shown on the right. Uh, with e increasing RPS requirements as um, we go on through the years. So how we're doing with this RPS goal is, well, in 2021, we reported a 38% consolidated RPS across all systems. Um, on the bottom left, we have 2020 numbers. So our consolidated RPS was 34.5% with the renewable generation type split into percentages as shown. Um, I wanna point out that our customer cited DER is one of our largest contributors with the next largest being wind energy. So as you can see from our 2020 RPS, uh, we are um, on our way, but we, need, we still need to make significant strides to uh, complete the next milestone years. Um, to support this stride, our company has developed a planning process called Integrated Grid Planning, or IGP. So what is IGP? IGP is an energy planning process, kind of like a business strategic planning process. We gather data and develop a plan to provide insights and directions for the future in order to meet our customer needs. Um, regulatory requirements and also clean energy goals. Um, the outcome of the process is a five-year action plan with strategies that will be used for long-term decision-making. Uh, the graphic on this slide shows the five major steps um, involved in the IGP process, and it's targeted to be a two-year planning process. So in step one, we collect data from experts and stakeholders, including the public on various key factors that will impact the plan. Um, the data is then analyzed and used to determine what the system grid needs are and what it might cost. 
the plan is then refined based on proposals gathered for potential projects, which include actual costs. Um, so as an example, if you were to remodel your kitchen, you might have an idea of what you want and how much it will cost, but you won't have actual costs until you have bids put together by contractors. So obtaining these bids is, similar, is a similar process we undergo in order to gather potential projects and what their actual costs are. Um, then in step four, using that information, the plan is further revised and optimized using uh, the best solutions to fulfill the grid needs within the schedule. Finally, uh, these plans are uh, presented to regulators for review. Here's a more detailed view of how the plan will be developed within the IGP process. So the process um, begins on the box on the left, inputs, assumptions, and constraints and scenarios. Uh, these are fed into distribu distribution models and also um, production simulation models. So the production simulation models identify the resource additions and the timings and when they are added to the portfolio. Uh, these production simulation model outputs are then fed as the starting point assumptions, um, which is where we are on the right hand side over here, uh, where we run simulations to, to, to determine whether these uh, solutions are viable. Um, then if needed, they can be reiterated at any stage uh, along these red lines. Um, they either go back into the distribution model or the production models until we have some viable input assumptions. And in our stage, we test if it meets the criteria. And if it does, then it goes into our final grid needs portfolio. So prior to the IGP process, uh, we perform two major RFP procurements for renewable energy resources, which is what we call the stage one and stage two projects. As a result of these large procurements, we have also conducted several major system studies with one of them still ongoing today. Um, the stage one and stage two procurements awarded the total amount of solar and battery energy storage capacities shown here. So there's about 371 megawatts solar and 556 megawatts of battery on Oahu, 175 megawatts of solar and 215 megawatts of battery on Maui, 120 megawatts of solar and 132 megawatts of battery on Hawaii Island. Um, the commercial operation dates for these projects are very tight, uh, expected to come online within the next two years. Uh, so this restricted the variety of renewable energy resources. Uh, for example, wind, geothermal, or any project that had long project timelines um, were not awarded. So unfortunately, a few of these Stage two projects have dropped out in recent months after studies were completed. Um, they faced negative impacts from the pandemic, such as supply chain issues and increased con construction costs. But even though uh, the numbers are lower than what's shown here um, in our studies still have the large amounts of renewable penetration um, with the developer provided models. And because of that, we also have a stage three RFP underway. Um, the company is preparing for a third round of procurement for renewable energy resources to replace the impacted projects. Um, there's a lot going on in the slide, but I'll briefly try to go over it. So the studies we have performed over the past two years are shown here. Um, after the stage two projects were awarded, uh, we started the system impact studies right away. Um, Traditionally, this was a IRS study, but we redefined it to be a system impact study or SIS. Um, so for this SIS, we perform traditional IRS uh, mainly in PSSE to analyze power flow and stability impacts by adding new projects. Um, in this traditional IRS, it was focused on the grid following implementations of the developer models. Uh, since grid forming was a new requirement for this RFP, um, we had a loose definition for what grid forming was and what we understood about it at the time. Um, so we also had a EMT study um, for the projects in grid following mode. 
Um, so why did we need this uh, EMT study in addition to the PSSE? Uh, at the time, we had concerns regarding the limitations of positive sequence simulations. Um, for example, the accuracy of the PSSE simulations, um, uncertainty of IBR model response, and we were worried about potential control interactions between IBR. Um, and simply because we didn't have the grid following models available on PSC, and we still don't have those available today from the developers. Um, so the grid forming study in the EMT software was finalized in June 2021. Some key issues and learnings that came out of that study uh, are listed here below, but I'll go over those in the next few slides. Um, after the stage two studies were completed, there was immediate need for to perform a near-term stability study, given the findings of um, the stage two studies. Uh, this is an internal study um, currently ongoing with the expected completion date of first quarter 2022. Uh, in this study, it's more of an in-depth look into the system compared to the IRS. Um, the IRS mainly focuses on a few uh, contingencies or disturbances near the developer POI, whereas our system stability study will cover um, all potential contingencies. Um, so in the next few slides, I'll just briefly go over our island-wide grid forming study in the EMT just, software. Just to make you aware, it's not just quite two minutes yet, but you've maybe only got four or five minutes at the absolute maximum, so you might want to just bear that in mind. Okay, yeah, I'll go over this quickly. So uh, here are the generation scenarios analyzed for each major island uh, in the study. Uh, and a few important points to mention is the total generation uh synch synchronous generation for all islands in orange range between from five to fifteen percent uh total dr generation is about fifty percent of the load and centralized iba projects fill the remaining gaps for generation um the existing and stage one ibr projects are in grid following mode and the stage two projects were studied in the grid following and grid forming implementations of their plan so in total, we have about 95% IBR penetration, and the purpose was to study, will this work? Uh, there were a few more specific concerns that we had in mind to be a uh, study. Uh, they are, will there be reliability concerns within the timeframe of 2023 or whenever these in-service dates of these projects are? Um, can grid forming technology improve reliability of uh, system performance compared to grid following? Are there any risks using grid forming technology? For example, any control interactions? And just for looking what needed to be done to mitigate any risk um, to meet our renewable targets. So the first key conclusion of the study is with the stage two projects in grid following mode uh, and the level of IBR penetration, the system was not stable in steady state. So here are two plots showing uh, just a flat line test with no fault or N minus zero. Um, when the dynamics were released in the EMT model, oscillations began to form. Over here on the left, we see a Maui example. Oscillations began to form and cause UFLS. Uh, in Oahu, we saw that there were sustained oscillations. However, when the stage two projects were so opt with their grid forming models, the system was stable and steady state. Uh, this plot is for comparison of the plot before where here we see the flat line. Um, the Q recommendation from this study was to continue to require grid forming technology and implement it um, as more projects come online. Um, so when we say implement it, we mean to put it in grid forming mode at the beginning rather than applying the mode when needed. Um, and this will allow operators to obtain experience operating with the grid forming controls. And also was to review the requirements in our document for future RFPs. 
Brian, you've really only got about one minute left, so I don't know if you can somehow summarise. I think everyone will get the slides anyway. There's there's a lot of really, really interesting stuff in this, but I don't think you'll have time to cover much more detail just to keep us on time. Okay. Uh, how about I just skip a few slides um, and just cover maybe one or two more. So the next yep. few slides, yeah, I wanted to share some grid forming related work and uh, what we've been doing. So quickly go over, we've been seeing from our procured projects here is some plant designs. We've we we are seeing PV and best hybrid plants. We see both AC and DC coupled implementations. Also have a standalone best plant, and all of the proposals are virtual machine and droop control technology. Um, how we define the grid forming definition. Brian, Brian, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but we really don't have time for this. I need to keep us to time because we, we have to finish it at the, at the sort of in about 30 minutes or so. So I'm I'm going to have to ask you to conclude if that's some, I'm sorry about that, but it, it was quite clear that it was 15 minutes if that's OK. OK, I don't like sure. that, but I need to keep us on time. It's unfair to the, the next speaker. OK, gotcha. I'll just uh, end it with this one then. So yeah. here's just uh, an example of grid following and grid forming. Uh, comparison that we are that we've been seeing in our current study. Um, you can see grid followings on the left, grid formings on the right, and we can see that you know this is the same contingency, but the grid forming response is almost immediate versus grid following, and this is a really good, um, I guess, demonstration of what we want for our system because we are islanded systems, and as we move towards renewables and 100% IBR, we're going to displace a lot of traditional uh, synchronous machines with inertia. So we want this fast response from the grid forming IBR. Uh, yeah. That's all I had. Thank you. That's great. That's great. And I think you just had, you had too much to tell us. And I think because Hawaii is so advanced and such a relatively small system, I think the, the rest of the world and some of the countries that are perhaps a little bit behind in the renewables journey and still have a lot of synchronous machines have a, a great deal to learn. So thanks very much for that. Um, I'm sure there might be some some time for some chat later on. So I think our final uh, talk is from Elena Size from uh, Siemens Gamesa. Um, we are running around five, six minutes, seven minutes behind time. So Elena, if you can um, take us up to the, the summary session, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon to all. Uh, we are going to present here uh, uh, the wind turbines with grid forming operation, and we are going to talk about double fed induction generation and also full converter experience. No, um, today too uh, couldn't make it, and will be Omer the one that replace uh, the part that we that he will be explaining. Okay, so uh, first of all. Uh, we are going to split the presentation in two parts, one focusing on double fed in genera uh, induction generation. It will be the output of the results of two projects, Softener and Flexener, and then the final, the field experience that we're obtaining with the full converter. No? As a first disclaimer, just to be sure no, that uh, here all the output and the results that we are explaining only uh, are uh, the results of the authors, uh, the author result, and not uh, the opinion of the whole organization, Simes Camesa, no? just to, to be sure that, uh, about the disclaimer. Okay, so let's start concerning the double pet. As we have mentioned, uh, the results that we have going to present, they are part of the Soften project and the Flexional project, and both of them are granted project by the minister, the Spanish minister. So we have already uh, discussed uh, in, in, in several presentations by now, no? and we still have, let's say, a, a common definition of the grid forming. If we check different sources, we can define and we can identify that there are a slightly different understanding of what is a, a grid forming. No? We are, uh, in all of cases, we have, uh, and, and we can check no, that uh, this will be the ability of any generation unit, no? To contribute to the system inertia, falling food, uh, falling feed, and also synchronizing talk. However, there are in some places that also Black Star is put, let's say, as a service associated to the grid forming. We won't hear as other um, uh, uh, other commenters have uh, have already allowed not to really decouple what is the grid forming capability with the with the Black with the Black Star. No? So here, this is a slide that 
to, to outline no? that there are still many different def definitions for the for the grid forming and that we should be talking about the performance that we want instead of the specific controller that we need. In this sense, we present here this slide no? in which we clearly identify that there are, like, let's say, two levels. No? On one hand, we have the control level and we are going to talk about the grid feeding, the grid supporting and the grid forming. No? The grid feeding will be, let's say, our actual situation in which our wind turbine operates as a current source. And in the grid forming, let's say that we are going to behave as a voltage source behind an impedance. As we have commented, uh, we can we should distinguish what is different controls regarding the converter operation with respect uh, what are the services that we need to provide uh, by our wind turbine. No? And here we can talk about inertial response, black star, island operation. We should be aware that, for example, a service such as inertial response can be also be provided with grid feeding or grid supporting. No? The only um, uh, problem is the response of that inertia response. If we really want to have a very or instantaneous, very, very fast inertia response, for sure, uh, we are going to need a control sim. But the regulator should define the performance of the wind turbine and the manufacturer propose the controller to be implemented for guarantee that the service is provided. In order to, uh, uh, let's say, design the adequate controller, we have worked a lot with, uh, with model analysis no? in order to have clear stability index and be sure to have a, 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 to be able to quantify how robust our controller is. No? Uh, so we are all, always going to use, let's say, model analysis and also PSCAR, like very, very detailed simulations. But the problem of the very, very detailed simulations is that sometimes you are just in front of the cliff and you are not going to realize. So in all cases, we are going to use these two methodology for a uh, design our controllers. As a brief summary, if we compare grid feeding versus grid forming, it's clear that with the grid forming, we are going to have more active control. And by doing that, we are going to enlarge our operational limits. But also it's true no, that we are going to have the control a little bit more, more coupled and that we should be careful because uh, it could arise an incrementation of the interaction with other elements that when we used to have the grid feeding as the controller was really the couple and we have a passive uh, element, no, a passive control, uh, those interactions with the rest of the system were not existing. So in order to, let's say, test uh, the, the grid forming and propose a, a new controller, we have, let's say, uh, and we are uh, going with a, uh, through a long path. No? First of all, with model analysis, we identify which was the better, the best strategy. No? Uh, once that we did that, we, go, we went through detailed models to start evaluating ready response to a small scale test range validation, to real scale test range validation, and we are going to end testing in an actual wind, wind farm from, from Iberdrola in a Spanish, um, in a Spanish wind farm. Uh, in addition to this test, let's say that uh, the results and, and here uh, are part of the Flexioner project. No? Flexioner project is a, is a wider project in, in which the aim is to uh, check the viability of a 100% renewable power system. No? This is a project that is led by Iberdrola Renewables and that we participate in many different manufacturers. In our specific role, let's say that is we are going to develop a new con a control strategies, specifically the grid forming, and we are going to supply different models. At the end, they will perform, let's say, global simulation of the full Spanish system to check if the viability of 100% renewable power system is feasible. No? Here, just as a sample, we provide simulations no, of our response, uh, 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 taking into account uh, frequency deviation and also voltage deviation, no? comparing the results here in this case with respect to the, the grid feeding and in this case with different uh, grid forms. No? Uh, here, the important thing is that depending, uh, uh, depending on what you want already to obtain, you can parameterize the controller uh, as the, in accordance no? to obtain the, the inertia that you really want and the droop that you really want to obtain. So if now we go through uh, the, the field experience here, Omer, if, if you want to, to start uh, with this part. Yes, I'm sharing my screen. Could you please tell me if you see it uh, in one second? 
I did it. I hope. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, it was going to be our colleague to uh, to present here from our offshore uh, business unit. Unfortunately, the last minute unavailability, he couldn't make it. And I'm Omer. I will do my best to present this part. Uh, yeah, so this is actually from three uh, previous studies uh, from uh, 2018, 19 and 20. Some results, uh, field results uh, with uh, full converter wind turbines with grid forming uh, technology. And before 2019, uh, it started with a single turbine uh, running grid connected in the test, in the first test for long durations to observe this behavior, its uh, impact in the turbine and its, uh, yeah. Uh, production also it was some five six thousand megawatt hours of energy produced during this uh, duration and the, after that in second stage that was again single turbine in a islanded operation with grid forming uh, function you can see here it was uh, started with a diesel and then left with a load and then a three turbine topology was uh, uh, tested uh, in a similar condition and again also with grid connected and islanding modes and then four turbines uh, for a medium duration and there were some disturbances these were the startups uh, before 19 and then 2019 i will actually go a little bit further we was uh, the, the the test was expanded to uh, wind farm in scotland with 23 turbines uh, three megawatts of each of them uh, the topology might be different in uh, different test cases, uh, but I just wanted to show the wind farm first. And it started, uh, yeah, I go back, in May, June 2019, and the inertia constant for the fire wind farm was uh, up to eight seconds. And uh, the various scenarios were tested uh, with different, uh, some turbines in grid forming mode, some turbines in grid uh, following uh, modes, current control, and uh, different inertia constants, uh, inertia uh, to be from 0.2 seconds up to 8 seconds. And during these months, two months, the wind was, uh, as you will see also in the results, was uh, varying uh, from uh, yeah, different weather conditions were uh, observed. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, sorry, this is also Tuya, the blonde guy here, uh, if you are curious about him. Uh, and then, luckily, there was an event in uh, during these uh, tests, uh, and it was an interconnection uh, tripping, which was like one gigawatt of loss and a 0.5 hertz uh, drop, as you can see on the top left. And the DFTT uh, rock of uh, reaching uh, or exceeding 0.1 hertz per second. And the farm output you can see on the bottom left uh, is, is as expected, as calculated here, uh, increasing by 1, 1 1.2 megawatts. So the farm was responding to this uh, frequency event, the real event. And the, the, uh, the, the difference between the reference and actual output can also be observed, seen here on the right bottom figure. And this is a like one minute uh, range. And then uh, in 2020 summer, again, a two months uh, testing uh, was done with uh, advanced uh, grid forming technology or uh, yeah, more functions uh, you will see here uh, where, where the where various tests were done. Uh, for instance, uh, the, these four turbines were operated as uh, grid forming, and then there was uh, uh, energization of other turbines and uh, resynchronization and energization of this uh, 240 MVA uh, transformer uh, with direct online energization with uh, some inrush uh, and uh, closing and opening this. Uh, records here uh, and also islanded operation again with a load uh, in, in the wind farm and here we see the results from islanded operation and the wind was as i said quite varying and in this uh, slide we see only the first string let me go back quickly 
Yeah, the first string, string A, was the only uh, string on the only turbines uh, active. Uh, the rest disconnected, and they were feeding the load, the local load. And uh, the local load was uh, stepped from six to seven megawatts, uh, and result responding to 0 0.75, 81, and 88 megawatts for average for these eight turbines. And uh, yeah, it was the response was quite good. Uh, you can see. And one one thing to note: uh, one of the turbines, A6, here was observing a low wind. Uh, so it was it's actually the one, the red line here, which is showing the minimum. But the average, the blue one, is quite uh, good, we can say. And the generator speed is uh, of that turbine is also the one showing uh, lower here. You can see the response of the pitch, uh, the maximum and the minimum pitch in these uh, eight turbines, and the average one. And then uh, there was a recent resynchronization after islanding uh, from the main grid, and there was a resynchronization there, or many of them, but there, here we see one example. Uh, if you are curious, let me go back to the network again. It, it was resynchronization with uh, at 33 kV with uh, B33, I think it should be. And uh, almost all turbines except one were running. And uh, first, the frequency reference was increased to uh, to bring it towards the main grid frequency. And at uh, this time, you can see the uh, synchronization is done. And uh, yeah, frequency difference is zero then, and then the voltage is uh, also matching, and then you can see the phase angle here. And another interesting test done here actually Part of a black start, I would say, personally, uh, is the energization of uh, 200 MVA transformer. Let me go back to the network again. 200 MVA transformer uh, and are being energized while the uh, while it is disconnected from the main grid. So the 22 turbines were running again, and the transformer wa was energized. You can see. The inrush, uh, and since it's almost the whole wind from running, so it is, uh, it was, and the current at uh, 33 kV, you can see here, reaching uh, one per unit, and the voltage was dropping uh, transiently, which might be or which can be acceptable, but yeah, depending on who is connected. And you, here you, you can also see the transient, the, the decaying uh, content of. Uh, the current and voltage, the THD, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this was it. I hope it was good enough uh, as uh, Tuya would do. And thank you for your interest. Thank you very much, Elena and, and Omar. It's really great, in fact, to see some some real world results, you know, it's, it's especially as an academic, um, you know, we see a lot of simulations and models, but because we're modeling a lot of stuff that we're not really sure how it behaves, you know, the way the way that well understood models of transformers and, and synchronous machines behave. It's, it's great to see some real field experience. So thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we're, we're kind of running out for time um, to do the sort of traditional Q&A, but I do see, Omar, that there's a couple of questions there just in your talk. I think the earlier talks, the, the, the speakers had a chance to answer the questions on the chat, and I think that has largely been done. But there's um there's there's a couple of questions there about Black Star capable unit, uh, and about the resistive load bank um, damping and power balancing. So I don't know if you can see that those questions on the chat. If you've got um, I can put you on the spot and see if you can maybe just finish by a comment on those. I am looking. Uh, I think from if I'm looking correct from Adrian, there is a question about can this be used as a Black Star capable unit. Uh, I mean, looking at the technical results and the papers, uh, uh, I mean, this demonstration, I can say yes. I mean, depending on how you do it, uh, commercially, I cannot say anything. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot. I may not. But uh, I mean, the 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 tests were were done like starting up the turbines first and then connecting the the components, the cables, transformers. So it was going fine. But of course, there were. Uh, difficulties, uh, challenges mentioned also in those papers. Uh, uh, yeah, with and uh, there was a lot of work on tap changers, uh, settings, uh, things like that. But yeah, it was working. And the the loading after the black start, as long as I know, it was 
I mean, it was tested in the island at islanding mode, so it's kind of the same, but I'm not sure if it was part of the that black start scenario, but resynchronization was part of it, you saw, so it was also going good. Yeah. So, and then there's, a, there's just a final question there about the resistive load bank, how it might help damping power balancing and how it's sized um, with, the, with respect to the overall capacity of the wind farm. I can answer partially again. I mean, I know as, as long as I know, yeah, it was helping the damping, especially when some turbines were uh, in grid forming mode. Yes. So, uh, or some tur only few turbines were connected, and uh, and uh, in that case, and also in the case like some turbines were grid forming and the others for grid following. So it was helping. Actually, in the, there was a lo the local load was helping. But when the full wind farm was running in grid forming mode, that was uh, found to be unnecessary. Uh, this is what I understood. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the time now, and I think it's it's time for us to, to close up. So just from my own personal um, perspective, I'd like to thank the, the organisers for the, the chance to chair this. I've certainly learned a lot. And I think, you know, the global nature of this is, has been really interested in looking from systems that are very big and strong and people coming from RTE and things like that, and then to systems like Hawaii, which is clearly very much along the, the journey of, of, of going to sort of very, very high penetrations of renewables and all the, the, the accompanying um, challenges and opportunities that come along with that. So I think it's been a fantastic event and I'd just like to thank you, you, you all. Um, and the, the interaction in the chat has been fantastic, almost too much for me to keep up with. I think this is one of the things where often when you, when you chair events in person, maybe people are a bit hesitant to ask questions in front of a large audience or whatever, and sometimes the chair has to do a bit more work dragging things out. If anything, it's been not overwhelming, but there's been so much going on and so many comments and questions. So I think the chat in itself is very useful and I know the slides will be presented. So for me, just to close, I'll just say thanks very much. Um, I can see Seamus making a, a thing there about the, the, um, the link for sharing contacts. And now I'm going to hand over to Adrian who will say a few words and then pass over for Seamus to formally close the event. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you very much uh, to, to uh, Professor Booth. And uh, in particular, I know Seamus will, will probably uh, say a few more words there to, to thank him. But yeah, great session, very well shared. Um, it was a packed agenda. It's a very, very packed and interesting topic. And when we put it out, the feelers for who wants to present, uh, we had so much um, uh, response and interest and we couldn't uh, exclude anybody. So that just meant shortening everybody. So we do apologize, but everybody stuck on point and it was it was a it was great stuff just a couple of housekeeping things you will get the slides uh, you will get the 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 video uh, and we're going to summarize the chat and try and put the answers with the questions as they're up there we'll anonymize it uh, but but in general uh, try and tidy it up that way yeah, just one final reminder, the EPRI workshop week is ongoing, so two more days, get onto the, the website and, and register for those events. And uh, yeah, th thank you very much. Fantastic presentations and great contributions. And I'll pass it to, to Seamus to, to close us out. Oh, thanks very much, Adrian. Uh, I just wanted to add my particular thanks to Campbell for doing a fantastic job. We gave you a completely impossible task and you almost managed to do it, which is truly fantastic. Uh, and thanks very much, of course, to EPRI for hosting this and uh, it's only through EPRI that we've got such a high level of engagement. So it's been an absolute roller coaster. I'm going to have to listen to it again three or four times probably to get it into my head. But uh, it's a my, it's an absolute mine of knowledge and it's a really brilliant event. Thanks very much, Campbell, and also Adrian. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a nice evening.